presented by Zales. You're watching the SEC on ESPN. The 12th man is rocking and ready for opening day in conference play in the SEC. Texas A&M taking on Auburn, and for the first time in a long time, it does feel like the SEC West is wide open. Mississippi State's the only team in the SEC West not playing a divisional game today. This is an SEC West matchup. Bob Wachusen here with Robert Griffin III. Chris Button is along with us as well. And if Alabama continues to stumble, if it is a wide open division, this is a huge opener for both of these programs. Oh, it's huge. And Bob, you know this, in the SEC, you lose once, the sky is falling. <laughs> you lose twice, it's Armageddon. So before, before, before both of these teams, what's going to happen today is they have an opportunity to show us how real they are. Connor Wigman for Texas A&M playing at an extremely high level, processes it very well, and he's going up against the 12th ranked uh, pass defense in the country right now with this Auburn secondary. But it's going to be determined on which Peyton Thorne decides to show up for Auburn and if he shows up great, it's going to be an extremely fun game to watch. Well, off of a below 500 season last year, the heat being turned up a bit on Jimbo Fisher here at College Station. And Chris, the heat has been turned up on everyone today. Yeah, welcome to just another day in the state of Texas where the temperatures today are supposed to get to 100 degrees. If that happens, it will be the second hottest game on record here at Kyle Field. Plus, by the way, the humidity when we came in this morning, 81%, which meant if you went up to the press box, they had to wipe down the windows it was so frost over you couldn't even see the field. Peyton Thorne, who grew up in Chicago, played at Michigan State, said, listen, I love playing in the heat. I'd rather do that than playing six inches of snow. As long as the humidity doesn't keep my hands wet, I'll be fine. Few scenes like it in all of sports, much less college football. Kyle Field, home of the 12th man, and we are set to go as Auburn won the toss and deferred. So Texas A&M will begin with Connor Wigman and the football, and they will try and get off to a hot start. Pearson sends it deep, and it will be a touchback out to the 25-yard line, and only a sophomore, but Connor Wigman Robert has an unbelievable grasp, it seems, of this complicated offense. Oh, yes, he does. And he not only has a grasp of that, he knows how to throw the freaking football. He always has the right velocity on his throws. As you see, he's ranked 10th in the FBS in passing yards per game. He can make the off schedule throws, he can make the off platform throws, and he's got a receiving core today that is about five deep. All these guys can really go up there and get it. But Connor Wigman is the one calling the shots. And honestly, he would be in the Heisman conversation right now had they not lost to Miami. He found Evan Stewart 11 times for 142 yards in the loss to Miami a couple of weeks ago. He begins this game with a check down to the freshman Reuben Owens out of the backfield. Zion Puckett making his presence known early. Came up to make the stop. Yeah, nice hit there by Puckett. But I like what Bobby Petrino's doing. Get your quarterback in a rhythm early in the game. Get him running and moving so he feels like a part of it. Nice, easy completion for him. It's only two yards, but there's a method to the madness. Amari Daniels is now the eye back, and a very late substitution running off the field was Evan Stewart. So the officials jump in and allow... Simpson, number 36 for the Auburn Tigers. Connor Wigman. So after the timeout, back to the offense, second down and nine for Texas A&M on this opening possession. And again, Amari Daniels is the back behind Connor Wigman. Oh, false start. So sputtering out of the gate, this Texas A&M offense. Number 71, five-yard penalty, second down. The press box is on the opposite side of the field for Kyle Olsen, but maybe once in a while he'll turn around and let us know what the penalty is. <laughs> maybe well. listen, everybody's stuttering out of the gates a little bit right, right here. Hey, Kyle, me, me in the open, him on where, which way he's supposed to be looking, the Kyle, offensive line's jumping off sides. We're over here. <laughs> <laughs> so second down and 14 after 
the false start. And this puts Swigman in a five wide empty set. Only a three man rush. Well protected and over the middle hits Anaya Smith. And Anaya Smith tough to bring down, gang tackled about a yard shy of the first down. Larry Nixon, Eugene Asante were there first. It's a gain of 13. And it makes it third down and very manageable, third down and a half yard. Nice job by Connor Wigman, not allowing the nickel defender there right there to dis dissuade him from getting that ball in there to Anaya Smith. Man, he's got a reception in 31 consecutive games. That is an impressive streak, Bob. I don't know about you, but I'd love to have a receiver like that to throw to. You had a few. Oh, yes. Yes, I did. Amari Daniels gets stood up. Second effort, he may have gotten the first down. Mosiah Nasili Kite was there to make contact, but the extra effort and a drive looks like it was good enough to pick up the first hit. I want to hear you say that name again, Bob, because you pronunciated every single one of them. But look at those two hit at the point of attack. As a running back, you got to keep your legs rolling. Nice job by Amar Daniels to keep pushing forward. Third down is the money down today. Both of these defenses rank in the top five in the country at shutting down the bank and getting offenses off the field. Whoever wins that battle could win the game. And then let's work. We're talking about Eugene Asante, a bowling ball of butcher knives on the offer defense. He's their leading tackler and sacker. He's going to have to have a big game today to give them a chance to slow down this offense and come away with the win. And obviously every quarterback wants to find that matchup right now J.D. Rim third string nickel is in the game but they'll run it on first down with Daniels mm. and there is not much there a gain of only a yard our first opportunity to say hi to Matt Barrett. Big game Bob good afternoon how about this for a start Jim Harbaugh's return against Rutgers Gavin Wimsat how about 69 yards of yak to Kristen Dremel and Rutgers up early on Michigan 7-0. As it should be representing the Garden State. <laughs> Second down and nine for Texas A&M. Wigman to throw. The slant is there. Evan Stewart gets planted. About a half yard shy again of a first down. Another big hit by Zion Puckett. Get used to seeing this route from Evan Stewart. His coach said he's unguardable on slant routes. He just knows how to set it, but look at him shaking his head right there. Hey, man, don't be throwing me into those hits all the time. Wide receivers don't like being hit, but good job of him not getting alligator arms and making that catch. Maybe on Moss. Spinning, has the first down. Grinds his way to midfield. Right there, Le'Veon Moss almost got almost got stuck behind his own offensive lineman. Kind of runs into his back a little bit, but finds his way through, does a nice little spin move, and keeps turning forward. You can feel the physicality from up here in the booth. Both of these teams know that it means more in the SEC, and you have to win at the point of attack. Swing pass. That may have been a backwards pass and a good catch by Moss. If he doesn't haul that one in, that may have been a live ball, and Jalen Simpson got him for about a four-yard loss. Wow. Le'Veon Moss looking like Randy Moss right there with the one-handed grab. And honestly, Bob, we always talk about this with HBO type of plays, you know, help a brother out. Right there, if he doesn't make that play, it's a bad result for, for the Texas A&M Aggies as they're flying around trying to get a fumble. That would have been a backwards pass as they have ruled that a running play in the box score. Wigman, the check down. Nice move by Ruben Owens. The freshman makes a man miss. Shakes and bakes his way down close to the 25-yard line. Steps out at the Auburn 28, picks up 26, and he left D.J. James in his way. Absolutely love to get this from the quarterback. Get to his check down and whoop, hit him with a little hurdle right there. That was a miniature hurdle like AAU days. If you're going to go low on the running back, you got to try to cut his thighs, not his ankles. Right back to Owens. No shaking and baking here as he is wrapped up by Keldrick Falk, the freshman, right at the line of scrimmage for no game. So, Bob, are you saying they, they just threw him out the kitchen right there? No shaking and baking? Get out the kitchen. You know, this is, to a certain extent, how Hugh Freeze told us he thought this game was going to play out. He expected that Auburn would going, was going defensively to give up some yards between the 20s. But now that they get down into field goal range, can they hold them to threes instead of sevens? Wigman, that's batted in the air. 
And that is an incompletion. Elijah McAllister, the transfer from Vanderbilt, who already has a master's degree from Vanderbilt, working on his PhD at Auburn. He is everything good about college football. So you're saying he's super smart, and he read the play right there by the offense and got into the quarterback's face. I mean, very, very nice play right there, recognizing it. And when you're 6'6", 271 pounds, get your hands up when you get near the quarterback, and you'll tip some balls just like that. And now it's third down and 10. Wigman has all day. He's going to go down eventually a coverage sack. Caleb Wooden drops him. And now you wonder if this is field goal range. They're going to send Randy Bond out, but it just got a little bit harder to knock one through as this one will be well over 50 yards, a 52-yard attempt after the sack. And you said it exactly right, Bob. It was a coverage sack. Nice job by the secondary, getting enough guys in the passing lanes to make the quarterback hold on to the ball, and then great close right there by Caleb Wooden to get the quarterback on the ground. This would tie Bond's career long that he put through last week from 52. Towards the uprights. He's got it. Just a shade inside of 52. It looks like that one will be officially a 51-yarder for Randy Bond, but it's the game's first points as AM has a field goal lead. One, not so hot last season, so now he's off to the best start at Auburn since 2019 and Bo Nix. He was told coming into this season he would be part of a quarterback battle and as a result decided to take his chances playing on the planes and he just met Shamar Turner in the backfield for a loss of a couple on first down. Yes, I call Peyton Thorne Mr. Icy Hot. Sometimes he's hotter than fire and other times he can get really, really cold and start turning the football over. But today, he's going to have to use his mobility. That is the, the equalizer for both teams is their quarterback being able to create outside of the pocket. Peyton Thorne is a really talented one. I think he's the first guy since Nick Marshall to rush for 100 yards and throw for 200 in a game, and that was way back in 2014. They let the play clock wind down and quarterback run here for Thorne. Not much. May have gotten back to the original line of scrimmage for a gain of two. There's the freshman Torian York, you said was going to be an impact player, and he came up to help on the stop along with Edger and Cooper. Oh, no doubt about it. Number 21, he is one of our impact players. He's a true freshman from Temple, Texas. Temple, Texas, stand up real quick. He's a freshman that also played as a true, uh, as a, as a, uh, a first-year freshman in high school, so he is used to playing in big spots, but this is the SEC for him to come out and be a, a true freshman linebacker in this game. It's going to be a lot on his shoulders to get everybody lined up. And M off to an amazing start on third down defensively. As you can see, Thorn to throw. Floats one over the middle, and it's incomplete. It looked like he wanted Javarius Johnson. And that's a dangerous throw if you airmail a crosser right in the middle of the field. Yeah, one thing you don't want to do is throw the ball high over the middle. Peyton Thorne sees what he wants. But right here, I'm going to need the receiver and the quarterback to get on the same page. Thorne, of course, missed the throw there. But as you're running that shallow across the field, if you see a defender outside of you, every coach in the country is going to tell you, you have to sit that down. Sit it down so you can catch it stationary and try to get vertical right there. They weren't on the same page. But Peyton Thorne's got to calm down a little bit. I like the mullet. He's got to make sure he's uh, a little bit more business today. <laughs> Rather than party in the back. <laughs> Wobbly kick from Oscar Chapman. Anaya Smith lets it take a sideways hop. This will be excellent field position for Texas A&M with the 3-0 lead. Only a 35-yard punt midway through the first quarter. Having fun inside and outside of Kyle Field. Cornhole! And some notable two sports stars, and Connor Wegman was one of them. Players in the state of Texas. He came to Texas A&M to do both, play football and baseball. This past spring decided, you know what, it's time that I give up the baseball. New offensive coordinator coming in, knowing that if the job was his, he had extra work to do during the spring. So he called up Jim Schlossingle, head baseball coach here, and said, Coach, I just can't do it. Coach said, you know what, I totally understand. There's a locker for you if you ever change your mind, but I get it. He's still around the program a lot, has a lot of good friends, but uh, has decided to stick to football. And RG, you, you as well have tried to do two at, at college. 
Here's Le'Veon Moss being brought down. Yeah, right? I'm standing next to a track guy that also <laughs> wanted to at Baylor, not only maybe play quarterback, but also run. How did you make the decision? Hard to divvy up your time. Yeah, it's very hard to divvy up your time, and I'm more than sure for Connor Wegman that it, it was a, a, maybe a first love for him with baseball. But when you make a commitment to play football, it's more than just about your talent and ability. It's about that connectivity and the relationship with your teammates. So I know that he wanted to make sure that that was in place, and that's what I did as well. I ran track before I ever played football at Baylor University, and I decided in my second year to go straight football and give it a full shot because my teammates deserve that from me. And I'm not saying that the guy shouldn't try it, but you know, at the end of the day, football is king. Moss gets free. 25 yard line. Knocked out of bounds at the 23. Picked up 36. Ooh -wee. Now, what you're going to see from Le'Veon Moss here is both patience and explosion. Watch him read it backside, then find the patience to go through that hole and fire away. Now, I'd like to see that ball on the outside arm so he can utilize the stiff arm there on Jalen Simpson. But at the end of the day, we're going to take this run and be happy about it as an offense. A couple of plays ago, DJ James shaking up at right corner as well for Auburn. So the injuries in the Auburn secondary continue to pile up. Wigman over the middle, into the red zone, go Texas A&M. Anaya Smith down to the 12-yard line. Great recognition there by Connor Wigman. He gets pressure off the edge. He finds his receiver, which is his hot route, and delivers a nice catchable ball to him. Anaya Smith, amazing awareness to know where he is on the field and when he is open. False start. Mm. Layden Robinson, the right guard, jumped. False start. Offense, number 64. Five-yard penalty. First down. Let's quickly check in with Matt. All right, guys, keeping it SEC. Kentucky and Vanderbilt. A.J. Swan. Good job avoiding the rush until that. Pick six, Maxwell Harrison. It is 14 nothing Wildcats early on SEC Network. 3 nothing early here for Texas A&M, but first and 15 in the red zone. Wigman, well protected. Another crosser. This time, it's Jade Walker. He's down to about the 10-yard line. Picked up seven. You're seeing all these crossers, and you look at the red zone offense for Texas A&M this year. I mean, to be top five in two categories of possessions and field goals, obviously they want to be higher in touchdowns, but that's really good for them. Uh, Another false start. False start. Offense, number 19. Five-yard penalty. Remain second down. So another red zone penalty, and their third penalty so far for the Aggies. Our featured week four games on ESPN Plus today. West Virginia and Texas Tech in Morgantown at 3.30 Eastern. Florida and Charlotte in the Swamp and Houston will host Sam Houston. Both of those are at 7 Eastern, 6 Central. To get ESPN Plus, go to ESPNPlus.com or download the ESPN app. Second down and long, we've been to throw. Fires one back left corner of the end zone. Getting tied up was Anaya Smith. No flag comes out. Uh-oh. Jalen Simpson waves the finger at the crowd, saying, no, no, no. And it will be third down and 13. Listen, Jalen Simpson's a very talented player, and he's waving at the crowd saying, no, no, no. And what he means is the ref didn't throw the flag. Okay, so it's not pass interference. But I, I want to get everybody home to know that it is pass interference when you get there early. He got there a, a tick too early, put his hand on the receiver, didn't allow him to go up and make that catch. But he shakes his finger, no, 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 because at the end of the day, the ref saved him on that. Well, he is tied for first in FBS with three interceptions through three weeks. Blitz off the edge. Wigman throws that way. Diving attempt incomplete. Anaya Smith, the intended receiver. Well, Hugh Freeze said they will move the ball between the 20s. We have to hold them to threes instead of sevens. Here is another field goal attempt. This one from shorter range, though, for Randy Bond. And you guys just saw the graphic with the red zone stats. Now, they are really good in touchdowns at tied for six in the country. But at the end of the day, when you get these field goals, you're keeping teams in the game. And I would say everyone watching this game believes that A&M's offense is a powerhouse. But if they're going to blow this game out, they're going to have to score touchdowns in the red zone. Bond from 32 right down the middle. 
Five and a half to go in the opening quarter. Six nothing, Aggies. Pat, we've got a six nothing lead for Texas A&M. Here is the 12th man on their feet. But neither team has found the end zone with five and a half to go in the opening quarter. Bob Shoes and RG3 and Chris Button, a touchback for Auburn. And the Jimbo Fisher train rolled into College Station back in 2018. Impressive through the first three years. 73% win percentage, 3-0 and in bowl games. Then a landmark 10-year, $95 million contract right before the 2021 season. And we've gone off the rails a bit. Last season, below 500. Mm. No bowl appearances since as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know this fan base wants to now see a bounce back season for the Aggies this year. And winning your SEC opener would go a long way to help get things started right. Bouncing off tacklers is Jarquez Hunter. Breaks another tackle with a stiff arm. And he's got a first down and a gain of 13. Tyreek Chappelle eventually pushed him out. Very nice run here by Jarquez Hunter. Sometimes it's not there when you first look for it, but he's out there trying to get butt naked in the secondary. Nice job putting that stiff arm to keep that ball on the outside arm. They're going to need a big day from Hunter to establish their running game and make sure they win that line of scrimmage. and m shows blitz. Here they come. Right behind the blitzer goes Hunter into the secondary again. They rushed off the edge. And Fadil Diggs eventually made the tackle after a gain of 14 more. Now watch, you're going to see two guys off the edge be unblocked. That's not sound football, but you know what is? When you're skinny inside of it right there like Hunter did to get away from those two free defenders, you don't want that to happen very often, but nice run there. They keep it with Jarquez Hunter. Tough to bring down. Mm. Boy, that's a hard work in five yards. You know what they say about quarterbacks if they're not in rhythm you got to get them back in rhythm But the best rhythm for a quarterback is a running game that's effective and right now it looks like on this series Offensive coordinator Philip Montgomery for Auburn is saying we got to establish that line no matter how many times we have to run it in a row Now Damari Alston is in the game although Hugh Freeze said back in April that Hunter is probably the best running back He's ever coached and the run game continues to push ahead for Auburn. They've got another first down behind Damari Alston. Ten more. They just keep pushing that pow, pushing that pow. And you look at them right now in the SEC, they rank first in rushing yards per game and tied for first in rushing touchdowns. When we talked to offensive coordinator Philip Montgomery, he said, a four-yard run is a good thing today. If we have to keep putting together four-yard runs and four-yard runs and win the line of scrimmage, at the end of it, it'll keep our defense off the field as often against this high-powered A&M offense, but it'll also make sure that our quarterback isn't tied up at back there holding the football, trying to make us win by throwing it 40 times. And they take the play clock down as well. Alston again fights his way to about the 30-yard line. A gate of two. Isaiah Rakes made the stop, and... Boy, you want to talk about brothers meeting once again, you and Philip Montgomery <laughs> yesterday. It must be really nice to spend some time with him. Listen, it really is. He, he was my offensive coordinator in college at Baylor, then he was the head coach at Tulsa, and it's been a long time since we've really had an opportunity to sit down and talk ball and break bread. It was great seeing him yesterday. He's in this situation as a coordinator in the SEC, and I don't know, what did you think about him yesterday in the meetings? Well, I, I thought it was interesting that he and Hugh Freeze both said with all due respect to the three teams we have played to this point, we're 3-0. Oh, we're going to find out a lot about ourselves today. And the ball is loose. It is jarred free and scooped up by Edger and Cooper. He's got a caravan down the sideline. Scoop and score for the Aggies. What a play right here. You get the pitch. The DB gets in there and makes the tackle, and then Edrick Cooper picks it up and hits him with the hit. -hit. Gets his feet from out there and takes it all the way to the house. That 
young man certainly got some edge to him. And it looked like Bryce Anderson with the form tackle on Damari Alston. Alston injured on the play, and they are still tending to him in front of the AM bench. But the ball jarred free. Cooper totes it 63 yards for the defensive touchdown. Oh, man. And that is an absolute killer for Auburn. That drive, nothing but running plays, controlling the line of scrimmage, and it ends up with six going the other way. Anytime you throw that toss, right, it's the job of that man at the first point of attack to protect that running back from getting hit that quickly. Bryce Anderson knifed through the offense right there. Really nice job putting the hat on the ball and getting it to pop out. And I know defenders everywhere are happy for Edger and Cooper right there. That's like a dream come true when you see that ball just dangling there on the ground. If you can scoop it and score. All the way across the field. To make so yeah, you'll see the hit right there. Pops the ball out, he reaches for it. And then when he goes to make this tackle right here, and that shoulder drives right into the ground. With all that force, that seems to be what hurt him. Mm. Hate to see that, man. So they will put Damari Alston. Well, now they are going to go to video review to see if this may be a passing play. Oh. And if it is a passing play, does Damari Alston have complete control of the football? If that's thrown forward, it's not a did he get a couple of feet down? and become a runner before the ball got charged free. That could be an enormous break for Auburn. Yeah. If this is ruled a forward toss, which would be a forward pass, and he didn't totally complete the process of catching it before the hit delivered by Bryce Anderson. Yeah, Bob. Yeah. That's Tyreek Cha uh, Chappelle, pardon me, in on the hit. So. Again, the rule is he has to have complete control of the football, get a couple of feet down, and then make a move common to the game or a football move and become a runner if this is judged to be yeah. a forward pass. And it's not where he, where he throws it. It's where the, the running back catches it to determine whether it's a forward pass or not. And it's going to have to be clear and obvious for them to overturn this as a fumble. So if you watch Peyton Thorne right here, so he has it here at the 35-yard line. So as he tosses it, where's it caught? It looks like it's caught at the 34. It's very close. That would mean that it's a forward pass and incomplete because he wasn't able to have complete possession of it. And we had this happen last week, I believe, Bob. Uh, you know, that receiver's got to be able to get two feet down and make a start to make a football move for it to be a complete catch. So is this a scoop and score defensive touchdown for Texas A&M? Or will Auburn get a massive break and end up having this ruled as an incompletion? In which case they would get the football back and that touchdown would come off the board. I uh, tell you what, it's, uh, usually you got to try to use your context clues here. When it's taken this long on a review, there could be a chance that it's, it's coming back and they're trying to figure out the clock and where the ball's supposed to be placed at and what's the down and distance. But... It looks to me like it was a forward pass and an incompletion. Which, to be quite frank, you would, would, to be quite frank, it would really suck <laughs> for Edric <laughs> Cooper if, if you're trying to take his 63-yard touchdown fumble recovery off the board. It did look like the ball was traveling slightly forward. Yeah. If it's traveling at all forward, obviously it's a forward pass. And I guess the other element at play here is, does he have firm control? Does he become a runner? I don't think he does. I don't think he gets that second foot down yeah. in time. So, Bob, our job is to call it like we see it, right? Got to take a, not just take a side, but use your, your own expertise to figure out what you think it is. And based off the rule, it appears that it's a incomplete pass. Well, if that is the ruling, the 12th man's going to have something to say about it. 
Let's see. After video review, it is an incomplete forward pass. So a massive swing back to Auburn. Yep. As that touchdown comes off the board, and they're able to put their offense back on the field. And I told you, you look, Peyton Thorne is tossing this at the 35, and it is caught forward at the 34. He doesn't get his other foot down, doesn't have complete possession of the ball. Ball comes out, incomplete pass. And as you can hear, you can barely hear the ref, because the crowd, the 12th man, was so furious at that call. They wanted that touchdown for their team. I don't blame them. I'm sure defensive players around the country are pretty upset, too. So it goes back to Auburn. That's the good news. The bad news, they're facing third down and eight on a drive where that was the first forward pass thrown. It's been nothing but running plays on this drive for the Tigers. Look for them to try to get number 13, Rivaldo Fairweather, involved. That's their big target tight end. Let's come it. Thorne spins out. Now he goes down. And that might knock them out of field goal range. The sack drops them back at least five to seven yards. Walter Nolan made the stop. It's actually a loss of eight. And now what will Hugh Freeze decide to do? Well, you know how you can get him from not hitting his favorite target? Get right up in his grill right there like the A&M defense did. Linebacker blitzing down the middle made him have to move. And then his man cleaned it up at the end. Nice job getting Peyton Thorne down there by the Aggies. Uh, from the line of scrimmage of the 30-yard line, an incomplete pass or no game there. No question they would have tried a field goal. That eight-yard sack backs them back far enough that they will now send Oscar Chapman out to punt. Delay game, kicking team, five-yard penalty remains fourth down. Well, that delay of game penalty may give Chapman a little bit more breathing room to try and kill it inside the 10-yard line. Sometimes the punters like the extra five yards of room. <laughs> yes, they do. Makes it a High oh! snap over the head of Chapman. He will get a kick off and does a good job to spiral it down the sideline as Anaya Smith. Rips off a return. What a job by Chapman. Out of bounds goes Smith at the 32-yard line. But that could have been a complete disaster for Auburn as Chapman was able to get a kick off. Holy moly, Oscar's thinking, that really chaps my you-know-what, but I'm going to get this thing out of here. That's what you call not breaking under pressure, being cool to get this one off because this could have been a disaster for War Eagle. He tracks it down. Stays calm and actually punts a beautiful one. Well, when you decide to punt from the plus 38 yard line, you are hoping for something inside the 10, if not inside the five yard line. So mm -hmm. this turns out to be a six yard exchange of field position for Auburn. That's almost like a turnover. It's yes. almost like you gave it away at the line of scrimmage. It is, and I will tell you this, they're, they're okay with the six yard punt as opposed to having A&M be in their own territory already if he didn't get that punt off. The freshman Ruben Owens finds his way out to the 38-yard line as we go back, back to Matt. Big game, Bob. It's now a Big 12 game between Oklahoma and Cincinnati, at least for a year. Nick Anderson punches it in, swing pass to the right. Oklahoma now on top of Cincy, 7-3. Final minute of play of the first quarter here, 6-0. Texas A&M. Owens again. And this time brought down after a gain of a yard by Jason Jones, the Oregon transfer. Third down and two. You know, as teams get closer and closer to midfield, we've seen them be more willing to run the ball and think that this is like a two-down situation, even on their side of the 40-yard line. But this AM offensive line has to continue to show that they can dominate up front with running the football. Owens looking for a cutback lane and not finding any. No gain on third down. Donovan Kaufman, who got injured a couple of possessions ago, good to see he's able to return to the game as he's backing up Keontae Scott, who is out today. So they can't really afford any more injuries on the back end of their defense. Kaufman a key, and he made the stop. And that will take us to the end of the quarter. 
So it looks like Auburn will get the football back to start the second quarter. Only 6 0. AM on top. First on ESPN. Plus. Welcome back to College Station and welcome back to the SEC on ESPN. It is steamy. And that first quarter flew by. 6 0. Texas AM on top. They're about to get the ball back to Auburn. ESPN College Football presented by Zales. And RG3, a good job by the Auburn defense to force the three and out after such great field position following the punt disaster, the near disaster. 100%. As a defense, that's your job. Sudden change, make sure that you don't make two wrongs. Uh, go back to back and take care of your offense. Line drive kick, Coy Moore. Returnable for the 21 yard line. Tripped up at the 30. That's still pretty good field position for the Tigers. And a moment ago, Chris caught up with Hugh Freeze. Coach, you've been able to keep the Aggies out of the end zone. For you guys on that side of the ball, how do you keep moving the chains? Well, you know, I thought we were having, a, we only had two drives in, uh, in the first quarter, and I, the first one wasn't good, but the second one we were moving along and obviously had the negative play there that put us in third and long, but, you know, I, I didn't see the pressure, but Peyton's got nice to, to be able to get three there, but uh, I think we got something in the run game that we can do, but we're still going to have to find a way to get balanced. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Robert, he said yesterday how important it was going to be for them to run the football, even if they play with tempo. They wanted to make sure they controlled the ball to give their defense some rest, considering the heat. Obviously, they want points on the board. That's a disturbing trend. Third straight game yep. without points in the first quarter. But the impact on their defense positive if they can continue to run. Yes, they can, but they got to get this passing game going. No completion so far in the game. Thorne, there's his first completion. Ryan Batte up the sideline. Right at the first down line again, and that is without measurement on Auburn first down. And Bob, you talk about taking care of their defense. What they really have to do is just stay on the football field. I don't care if it's quick game, if it's movement, if it's play action pass down the field. Getting your offense and your receiving core going doesn't have to be done any one which way, but they can't hurt themselves like they have so far today. Putting drives together is what this Auburn offense needs to do, and Peyton Thorne has to play better, better at the quarterback spot. Aggies bring a blitz off the edge, and it is successful. Bryce Anderson was there to bring down Peyton Thorne. They did not account for him, and he didn't do much to disguise it as well. He crept up well early in the cadence, you talk and about, the protection didn't slide. You talk about no, no surprise. Whenever you see a guy line, uh, lined up on the line of scrimmage as a quarterback, you know that I've got to get the football out. This guy's coming. He's not letting anybody in the stadium know that he's going to be dropping. He has his ears pinned back, and he's staring at you. Get the ball out. Thorne to throw on second and long. Up the seam, and it's incomplete. Intended for Tyler Fromm. And Fromm shaking up on the hit. Oh. As you're going to see, a little play action pass. Trying to get him down the seam. He has him, but he just airmails it a little bit. And Josh DeBerry, I mean. You can honestly say that that was probably an unnecessary hit right there. The ball's clearly not completable. It's about to hit the ground, and he hits a defenseless receiver, but the refs didn't see it that way. Third down and 12. Only a three-man rush. Thorne slings one to the sideline. Very close to a first down to Shane Hooks. And he was very close to the line of scrimmage when he threw it. Josh DeBerry made the hit but that is a first down to midfield yeah first down you see shane hooks works out of his progression right there on the sideline gets both feet in nice job by peyton thorne of, of stretching it all the way to the line of scrimmage before getting rid of that ball screen out to the edge to hooks oh makes one man miss and gets it into plus territory. A gain of eight to the 42-yard line of Texas A&M. Well, right there, Shane Hooks did all that on his own. His, uh, his brother out there didn't help him with any blocking, and he made that guy miss to get down the sideline, making Peyton Thorne right. In those situations, when you throw that bubble, we're saying we need to get at least five yards to warrant that throw, and they certainly got that.
Play clock down to seven. Auburn still trying to get lined up. Play clock at three. They get the snap off. Ryan Batte. This is the first trip into plus territory for this Auburn offense, and they've got another first down. Shamar Turner brought down Batte. As we talked about before, for Auburn's defense, they needed to hold AM to field goals in the red zone or when they get into plus territory. And it's because of reasons like this. You give your offense time to get going. Right now, Peyton Thorne's got a couple easy completions. They're running the ball effectively. They just got to make sure they don't shoot themselves in the foot like they have today so far and for the most of the year. A lot of pre-snap movement here for Auburn. Again, blitz coming off the edge for Texas A&M. That team for the flag down. He's got another first down if the play stands, but the flag thrown back at the line of scrimmage. It looks like this one might be coming back. Holding offense, number 53. Tim Norton from the start of the foul. Remains first down. That's the right tackle, Gunner Britton. That's called for the hold. You're going to see Gunnar Britton right there, number 53, as Brian Batiste takes this snap. He's trying to work on the nose, gets him going, and right there. Okay, I'm sorry, guys, that's not holding. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not. I got to be honest with you. We're always going to keep it a buck up here in this booth. That's not holding. <laughs> Britton sliding into guard there, as they have also, with some injuries to Isavion Miller, Cam Stutz, they were question marks coming into today there's been some shuffling up front with that Auburn offensive line as well but that holding penalty nets them out to first and 18. Jay Fair in motion play action for Thorne a rollout a check down and not much there's Rivaldo Fairweather showing up for the first time he only picks up three yards you know Bob you mentioned earlier that you're seeing a lot of pre-snap motion a lot of movement well Philip Montgomery the offensive coordinator for Auburn told us this week he doesn't feel like AM really adjusts very well to the movement. It makes them have to communicate, shifting the strength of the formation, giving them a bunch of eye candy so that they can have guys misfit their gaps. You saw that on the run by Brian Petit two plays ago. Let's see if they can continue to work that. Again, they take the play clock down inside of five. Born well protected long throw down the sideline wide open was Jay Fair and Thorne missed it That's another high throw to an open receiver and frustration for Hugh Freeze on the sideline. Oh my goodness No You see this right here nice little wheel route. They get him to jump the inside route there Jay is saying this is not fair I'm wide open for a touchdown and I told you guys earlier in the broadcast, it determined, the, game, the thing that's going to determine this game is what Peyton Thorne shows up. And right now, it's the Peyton Thorne that is overthrowing guys and does not look in rhythm at all. Threw it over Tyler Fromm's head already on this drive. And that got Fromm banged up. And that time, he had fair all alone. Instead, it's third and 15. Here comes the blitz again. And this play is whistled dead. Delay of game is going to be called on Auburn. Delay of game. Offense. Five yard penalty. Third down. That's going to make it third down and 20. And coming up at 4 Eastern, 3 Central on the SEC Network. Number 23, Tennessee will host Texas San Antonio and Knoxville at 7 Eastern, 6 Central on SEC Network. Plus, Florida will host Charlotte. And we cap the day, Mississippi State and South Carolina in our SEC Saturday night matchup. All three games are available on the ESPN app, so you can watch anywhere. Well, now game management. Is this just about trying to get in the field goal range? It is. It's third and 20. Listen, if the check down's there, throw it. Do not try to force anything. Well, that throw knocked away. Camden Brown had it in his hands, and it was charred free by Deuce Harmon. And that will force Auburn to punt. Now, when you say don't force anything, I don't think that was a forced throw at all. Camden Brown was coming wide open on this nice dig route. Peyton Thorne reads it perfectly. And to be quite honest with you, that's a drop. Camden Brown has to make that catch. You're, you're not paid in college football to catch the football unless you got NIL money out there. 
But at the end of the day, you have to be able to bring in those contested catches. Great throw by Peyton Thorne. Unfortunately, his brother didn't help him out. And the easy hookup to Jay Fair was the one that they're going to regret missing. As Anaya Smith is back deep. Again, the long snapper Reed Hughes. Last time this punt group was out there. Put one over the head Dwayne of Gale, Chapman. Five-yard penalty remains And there's another delay of game penalty called against Auburn. Those seem to be on purpose. You know, just strategically to give your punter more room so you can pin the Aggies back deep. Let's see if they can complete the uh, exchange here. That time the snap perfect. Chapman looks for the corner. Instead, it floats down the middle of the field all the way to the goal line and into the end zone for a touchback. It's a 51-yard punt, but it will come out to the 20 here in College Station. A&M with the 6-0 lead. The coach prime effect is real. There are a lot of media stars and a lot of outlets that have taken notice of what's going on in Boulder. All of these folks have hit social media to talk about Colorado football and two more big games on ABC in the app. Coach Prime and Colorado taking on Oregon at 3.30 Eastern. And then at 7.30 Eastern, Texas Baylor in Waco tonight on ABC. Should be two good ones this afternoon and then this evening. Back to the offense, Connor Wigman with a touchdown lead. Diving attempt wide of Anaya Smith. It'll be second down and 10. You talk about Coach Prime, he's really taking over all of college football. You know, they're flashing the watch on everybody they possibly can there. Shadur Sanders is a Heisman candidate. And I know there's a lot of SEC schools out there that probably wish they had a coach like Coach Prime who could drive the attention and also put a great product out on the field. What he's been able to do with a team that won one game last year so far has been nothing short of amazing. Owens and Moss flanking Wigman. It'll be Le'Veon Moss. Third down and about a yard and a half coming for Texas A&M. Well, he talked about the impact of Deion Sanders on the TV ratings and certainly a 1-11 record last season, undefeated this year, and a major national factor. Oh, major national factor. And everyone wants to say, oh, they haven't played anybody and they went to a double overtime with Colorado State, but we got to give them the same amount of grace that we give all these other schools that have been struggling the first three weeks. Incomplete on third down, miscommunication. Jade Walker had not turned his head as Wigman threw the quick out, and that'll make it fourth down and a yard and a half. It'll be another three and out. Four straight incompletions for Connor Wigman. I said today was going to be a big day for Connor Wigman going up against the 12th ranked pass defense in the country. But what I didn't mention was that they're the fourth ranked defense in the country on third downs. And they've been able to get them off the field pretty consistently here. Obviously, that's not what you want. It looked like Wigman gave J Jade Walker a signal and they weren't, they didn't think it was the same signal. So you got to make sure uh, in those hieroglyphics out there, they got to be on the same page. And Constantino, high wobbly kick. Boy Moore, fair catch in traffic down to his knees. But only a 35-yard punt. So again, good field position for Auburn when we come back. ESPN College Football presented by Zales is brought to you by the Lexus ES, a direct reflection of you. On the last meeting between these two schools, Auburn with Cadillac Williams at the helm, taking over for the fire, Brian Harson Beat the Aggies last year 13-10, and Cadillac enjoyed it, to say the least. I'm so appreciative of this Auburn family. Many fans, they showed up and showed out, man. The energy. The atmosphere here. Man, I, I, just, I just think I'm so appreciative for this institution. I'm forever indebted to it. And he is still the running backs coach on Hugh Freeze's staff. Hugh Freeze said yesterday, said to watch what he did last year and the fan base, how they feel about him. It was a no-brainer to keep him as a part of this coaching staff. As Thorne with a pump fake. Finds one of those running backs that plays for Cadillac. A nice cut by Brian Petit. Puts his left foot in the ground and picks up a first. 
I mean, Bacon like Cadillac. Listen, that <laughs> run right there was so impressive. But when you talk about Cadillac Williams, I remember this guy when I was growing up. I was born in 1990. Phenomenal running back. But what I saw from this man last year was one of the most inspirational jobs you could do as an interim head coach. He was tied in emotionally to the team. And that speech he gave after that win was one of the best I've ever seen in my entire life. You just say out loud you were born in 1990? Yes, I was, Bob. Mm. 90s baby. Mm. My bald spot just got an inch bigger. <laughs> Let's check in with Chris Button. Uh, I won't tell you when I was born then. Uh, uh. But <laughs> they preach Auburn family, which is one of the reasons that Hugh Freeze kept Cadillac Williams. But he's got three assistants on his staff that have either won SEC championship rings or an NCAA championship. Secondary coach Zach Etheridge on the squad and then wide receivers coach Marcus Davis that it's wanted to have that feeling of what it's like to preach family like Cadillac Williams and the emotion that he showed a year ago. Well, you could see on his face and in his voice what it meant to him to win that game last season and to still be a part of Auburn football. Second and 10 from midfield. Thorne on the move. Nice cut back by the quarterback and he is cut down with a flag down in the secondary by Bryce Anderson. He picked up six. But let's check the flag. Holding offense from the 27. Ten yard penalty from the spot of the foul. Second down. So another Auburn penalty back to Matt Barrett. The big one in the ACC, Clemson and Florida State. It's been all Tigers till Keon Coleman from Jordan Travis. Wide open, Seminoles on the board. 10-7, Clemson in the second. So that game relatively low scoring. This one as well, as Texas A&M has only managed a couple of field goals. That part of the game, RG3, from Hugh Freeze's standpoint, playing out exactly the way he hoped. Uh, exactly the way he hoped, but they need to throw a flag on these offenses right now because they are looking pitiful <laughs> in trying to put drives together. <laughs> Back to throws, Peyton Thorne. The pocket collapses. He's got nowhere to go with the football, and there's no daylight past Torrey and York. A penalty and then a sack, and it will be third and a mile. Now you're going to watch the coverage right here. They got the double outs with the dig right there, and he's got a man wide open. Michael Johnson is right there wide open, and then here on the other side, he's got two guys over under on this on the receiver. But when you see this as a quarterback and you step up in the pocket, the second that you second guess that throw, take off and go. You don't have all day in any level of football to just pat the ball, pat the ball. Right now, Peyton Thorne is either not seeing it or not trusting his instincts at the quarterback spot. Hunter with a cutback. And now a decision to make. It was third down and 19, and he picks up 15. Now it's fourth and four, but in an area where you might think about going for it on the plus side of the 50. Nope, it looks like Hugh Freeze will keep it conservative, play field position, and he will send Chapman out to punt. You know, that run actually was probably just to play the field position game. Their defense is playing at a real high level right now. And this is Hugh Freeze saying, I trust my defense. I trust Ron Roberts, defensive coordinator, to continue to shut down Texas a &M. Well, that trust has paid off so far. This is a low-scoring game. And their one missed tackle or one Peyton Thorne accurate pass may be away from taking the lead. Delay a game. And they might have been ready to fake that punt. <laughs> Delay game, kicking team, five-yard penalty, main fourth down. Unless Oscar Chapman was just goofing around. It looked like he was about to throw the football. Yeah, I think Chapman was goofing around. <laughs> they're getting all these delay game penalties, and they are truly delaying the game. I know they want to give their punter a little more space so that he can, you know, pin them in the in the deep end, but we can't just keep allowing them to take these delay games. Something's got to be doing, done about that with all these rule changes happening. This time he does put it to the sideline. And at the nine-yard line, the fair catch by Anaya Smith. So the field position decision by Hugh Freeze works. And the pass rush, RG3 has gotten home. They're keeping him in the pocket, and then they're making him sit down. Kinda like it, gets me excited. Sections across the country are competing to be the Taco Bell Live Moss Student Section of the Year. Download the Taco Bell app to learn more.
And you're never going to find a student section and a crowd in general like the 12th man more coordinated. Those yell leaders, boy, they know every single word, every single cheer. Yes, they do. And it's just awesome to watch as Amari Daniels starts off this drive with a one-yard gain. The last couple of possessions for Texas A&M, three and outs forced by Auburn. RG3, if they were to do that here, who knows what kind of field position they might get before halftime. Yeah, it would be exactly the reason that Hugh Freeze decided to punt. But you talk about that 12th man, and I've played here before. It is a true home field advantage. These fans show up all the time and really make it hard on opposing teams to ex execute. Wigman, nice throw underneath. And the catch made by Jaday Walker. That time they were on the same page. And it's a pickup of about five, but there is a penalty marker in the backfield. So we'll have to check this flag. Personal foul, tripping, offense, number 63. Half the distance of the goal, remains first down. So that'll put the ball back to the five yard line. Second down. Wow. So he really was tripping out there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. I'm Bob Wachusen, the comedic stylings of Robert Griffin III. <laughs> Chris Budden is with us as well. Watch the right side of your screen. Yeah, you're going to see. Oh, that's definitely the wrong number that they said out there, but it looked like when the offensive lineman fell down, he put his leg up to try to keep the guy from getting to his quarterback. It looked like Trey Zoom, the left tackle. So from the end zone, Wigman, nice strike to Evan Stewart. And that gets Texas A&M some breathing room out to the 10-yard line, although it will still be third down at about eight as Jalen Simpson wallops Wigman on a blitz in the end zone. Connor Wigman shaking up. He's not right. Yeah, he's really shaking up as you see him drop back to throw. He makes this pass. Oh, looks like his ankle might have got stuck in the ground right there at the end of that hit. So Wigman, a slant across the middle, jarred free. Walker couldn't hold on. He was hit hard, and Zion Puckett in on that collision, and he is down and injured for Auburn as well. This has been a very physical football game, and it's being felt on both teams. Yes, it is. And as you see Connor Woodman scan the field, he comes back. And right here as a receiver, you just got to brace yourself. He's coming with the corner coming on his back, and you got the safety trying to knock his face off. Got to try to hold on to that one. Okay, and Lee and Zion Puckett combine on the hit, and Puckett still down. I'm Matt Barry. We have a loaded Lexus halftime report coming up. Florida State, Clemson, back and forth, a big one in the ACC. Plus, we'll hear from Coach Prime ahead of their game against Colorado. And Jim Harbaugh returns from Michigan today. Dan Mullen, Joey Galloway joining me coming up on the Lexus halftime report. All right, Matt, thanks very much. Punting from the end zone will be Nick Constantino for Texas A&M. Boy Moore at midfield and this a returnable kick from across the 50 and he dives to the 44 yard line of Texas A&M. That's a great field position for Auburn. Chris with an important injury up there. Connor Wigman has gone into the locker room to have further evaluation on his left ankle. They took him also into the injury tent. Jimbo Fisher went in to check on him. I watched him and heard him coming off the field. He was shouting in pain, barely able to put any pressure on that left lower leg. So the quarterback for Texas A&M is in the locker room. Max Johnson was warming up a moment ago. The LSU transfer as Wigman limped back, maybe to get some x-rays taken. Zion Puckett did make it to the Auburn sideline on his own power, but that shoulder might be banged up. And boy, talk about banged up. The back end of that Auburn defense, injury after injury. And it really hurts the Aggies if they don't have their starting quarterback to try to go out there and take advantage of it. Toss sweep to Hunter. Down to about the 41-yard line. Tripped up by Shamar Turner after a gain of three. It'll be second down and seven. And you're seeing a concerted effort from offensive coordinator Philip Montgomery to run the football. The quarterback play has been a little shoddy today, but, you know, they started to get him rolling a little bit by moving the pocket. Well, you can continue to do that if you can get four and five yards at a time on these runs. Only three right there, but you got to keep beating your head against the wall against this Aggie defense. 
T again. Third down and a yard to come. As he bulldozes his way to the Texas A&M 35, we have another injured player. And that looks like Walter Nolan, one of those defensive tackles, which is the strength of this Texas A&M defense, as important as the back end is, they are built around that defensive line, and now the starting defensive tackle, Walter Nolan, is down. As you said, Walter Nolan, one of their big guys up front. Oh. Just looks like he collapses there in the middle. Got a helmet flying off. We never want to see any of these guys get hurt. We love the game of football, but their health is the number one priority. It's good to see Walter Nolan up and able to walk off the field this season. For every field goal, an extra point made by participating universities. Allstate will make a contribution to the university's general scholarship fund. Thank you to Allstate. And all we've had so far is a couple of Texas A&M field goals. Important moment in the game here as well. Third down and one. And remember, Auburn starts the third quarter with the football as well. Straight ahead run. Down. That was the first time that Auburn had a third down of less than eight yards, and they couldn't move it six inches. Torian York gets the stop, and it looks like the Tigers will go for it. And you'll watch number 21, Torian York, in the middle of the screen. He's going to read this out perfectly and just slow the back up enough. Get that ankle so that he cannot continue to drive his legs and get that first down. Nice job by the freshman. Big running back Sean Jackson, 236 pounds, lines up behind Peyton Thorne on fourth down and a yard. A bootleg for Thorne. Gets to the sideline, leaps, spins around, and where will they spot the football? Tyreek Chappelle, Torrey and York, they were both out there on the edge, and it looks like without measurement, they will say that Thorne got it. Yes, he did. You see the play action. He comes out on the boot, and then he tries to go full John Elway to get the first down. Now, Bob, the difference is John scored a touchdown. <laughs> and that was one of the biggest games of all time. But it shows you that Peyton Thorne is determined to try to help these Tigers come out with a victory today. Big, big moment for a first down right there. Maybe let's see if they can piece together a few more shots down the field as they have not been able to get their passing game truly going with their receivers. Avoiding a sack. At first was Thorne, but then he goes down. You can only dodge so many pass rushers. Chris Russell Jr. in the backfield. Fadil Diggs was there as well. Yeah, Fadil Diggs has been all over the place today in the backfield, making the quarterback move. And I honestly thought, actually watching the replay there, Peyton Thorne missed an old wide open guy running down the sideline. He's got to trust his receivers down the field because they have these one on one matchups. He's got to let that bad boy go. Again, Aggie show blitz. They'll run left instead. A tee to the 31 yard line to make it third down. And a long seven close to eight. And now you're back in this third down situation. And we talked about this earlier how Rivaldo Fairweather is their go to guy in the passing game. Right now, he's got one catch for three yards. Big number 13. He's a mismatch nightmare for them. They've got to try to get him involved here. Neither team using a timeout. And Auburn's going to let the clock wind down. It looks like 12 on the play clock. Somewhat surprised Jimbo Fisher didn't call timeout to save some time for his offense. But, of course, his quarterback's in the locker room. Thorne again. Sacked at the 36. Well, now it's fourth down and forever. McKinley Jackson. The fourth sack of the first half for Texas A&M. You name them, they got them at Texas A&M. A bunch of five stars, guys pushing the pocket and actually playing their assignment. Their defensive coordinator told us that they have to not just get to the quarterback, but they got to maintain and contain this guy. When he starts to break, they're beating him to the punch. Now, you freeze told us Alex McPherson in practice has made 60 plus yard field goals. He's very comfortable in the 52 to 53 yard range. 
And by, if you're Texas A&M, allowing the clock to wind all the way down like this by not calling a timeout, Hugh Freeze will spend one with 10 seconds to go as we have a quick word from Cheez-It. I'm rg 3 it. See you next time. Right, hey, who changed my name to rg 3 it? Me? It's a great combo. Like college football and Cheez-It, you like? You cheddar believe it. And how will college football fans feel? You're gonna be feeling the cheesiest! All right, a strategy question off of that masterpiece, I have to ask you. <laughs> if you're Texas A&M and you call time out there with, say, 45, 50 seconds to go, do you think Auburn tries this field goal? I mean, by letting the clock wind all the way down to 10 seconds, if Auburn misses the field goal from near midfield, there's not enough time for Texas A&M to do anything with it. No, there isn't, and you just, you know, asked and answered the question there, but the real question is, how much faith and trust do they have in Max Johnson if Connor Wigman's not going to be able to play quarterback for the rest of this half or the rest of this game? They might just want to get to halftime. Well, now Jimbo Fisher will call timeout. I guess my thought is, if Texas A&M calls a timeout with, say, 40 plus seconds on the clock and Correct. they still have a timeout to use right if you're Hugh Freeze You know if you miss this field goal You're giving them the kind of field position that even with their backup quarterback. They may take shots Correct. Well, there's only 10 seconds to go in the half now You let the clock wind all the way down now the harm of missing the field goal if McPherson misses it Is not nearly what it would have been if there was time on the clock for Texas A&M's offense to do something with it. Not at all, and you're 100% right. I'm just saying from Jimbo Fisher and Bobby Petrino's position, they're saying, all right, do we really want to throw our backup quarterback in there Good with point. 45 seconds left on the clock and tell them, all right, we're going to go try to put some more points on the board before the half? They might say, let's take it into halftime, figure out what's going on with Connor Wigman, and then be able to get whatever quarterback ready for the second half to go win. Well, 53 for McPherson to try and get Auburn on the board. He certainly has the leg to reach. And he's got it! Sneaks it over the crossbar inside the left upright from 53. McPherson is good. And Auburn, with five seconds on the clock, gets on the board. A field goal first half, and it looks like it will be an AM field goal advantage at halftime. What a kick! He put the fear in that football, got it up long enough, almost hit one of the guys in the face. Amazing kick right there. You don't see that very often in college football with these 50 yarders, so it's pretty cool to see. I know my man Justin Tucker for the Baltimore Ravens is very excited about that kick. <laughs> we got a couple of 50 plus yard field goals made in this game as McPherson puts it through. Randy Bond had a 51 yarder for Texas A&M. And now Auburn will also start the third quarter with the football after McPherson puts it through from 53 yards out. Barring a special teams breakdown here for Auburn. They've got some momentum going in at halftime. They do, and we've seen special teams play a big part in SEC football play, but we know where thought that this would be the case in this game with these two teams, the way that they have been putting up points, but that just goes to show you that all three levels of your team have to show up when you play in the SEC. There's a squib kick that will roll down to Anaya Smith, and he's got some room to the sideline. And some blockers there to help him. He'll cut it back. And eventually is spun down at the 33. And that will take us to halftime. So it's a field goal game at the break. Auburn will begin the third quarter with the football. Time for the halftime report with Joey Galloway and Dan Mullen. Back to Armin at back. Yeah, and when you, when you talk about Max Johnson, when we talk to their coaches, Bobby Petrino and Jimbo, they said, listen, he's not the same guy as Connor Wigman. We do trust him, but we'll have to scale some things back. And when you look at the keys to the game that we talked about earlier, they've really come to fruition here today. You have to talk about the lace front portion of this game. We're talking about Connor Wigman. He's not no regular wig. He's a lace front, and he might be out right now. They've kept him out of sync. And when you talk about show me the money, the teams right now combined to go 3 of 14 on third down. Both defenses are top five in the country on third down, and they're showing up right now. And then let's work Eugene Asante, number nine linebacker for Auburn, has showed up in a big way, three tackles, but he might have to make a game-changing play in this one to push the Tigers over the top. That's Robert Griffin the third. I'm Bob Wachusen. Chris Button is with us as well. Low scoring first half. And we'll see if Auburn, they started to find a couple of cracks in the, in the uh, Texas A&M defense in the first half with the run game at times. 
And you'd have to think they will need that in the second half to help take the heat off Peyton Thorne. It feels like for Auburn, they might have to make a decision. Early on in this in this second half, they need to try to mix up the pass and the run. But if they cannot get the passing game going, then it has to be all out running the football. And I honestly would like to see them get Robbie Ashford a little involved at the quarterback spot in some situational plays because the guy's a freak athlete and can really add something to this offense. Bonds kick returnable. That tee from the three-yard line. Brought down shy of the 20-yard line. That's a good hit on special teams by Edger and Cooper as we go down to Chris. Bob Connor Wigman still being evaluated by the medical staff for a lower left leg injury. No information about whether or not he will be able to return to this game. So it's likely when AM gets the ball back that you're going to see Johnson in at QB. Now, Max Johnson will be looking at a continually banged up secondary as well for Auburn. They lost DJ James in the first half. They don't have Keontae Scott out with a right foot injury that required surgery. Zion Puckett left the game with a shoulder injury as well. Even Donovan Kaufman left and then returned. So it has been a juggling act for Hugh Freeze and the defensive coaches in the secondary. But their offense on the field first. And there is Fadil Diggs again. Took down Jarquez Hunter. You know, when we talked to Fadil Diggs yesterday, he said, I want to show the offense that I will be here every single snap. There will be no breaks. There will be no time off. And when you're a defensive end at the edge and they run away from you, the amount of effort this man just showed to go and close down that gap and get the back down to the ground is exactly why this a and defense has gone from 123rd ranked in, against the run to right down to the middle of the pack. Massive improvement. Hunter empties the backfield. Four. He'll go down again. Well, that pass rush has been tough to handle. There's Walter Nolan. He'll be credited with the fifth sack for Texas a and And when you watch it, this pressure is cumulative, right? They're not just winning one-on-ones. They're pushing and collapsing, almost trying to have a, a defensive team meeting. And watch this coverage. They've got guys over the top, guys underneath. Payton Thorne is going to have to start throwing some checkdowns and allowing his checkdown receivers to make a guy miss. Thorne sees a possible blitz coming with the play clock winding down. It's a draw play, but it might be a delay of game penalty as well. Let's see, did they get the snap off? Bad start, offense, under 66, five yard penalty, remains third down. Uh, they beat the clock, but Avery Jones called for a false start. That's penalty number seven for Auburn. It's clearly, clearly not what you want from an offensive perspective. You got third and long, now you got third and really long, and you don't have wide receivers right now that much of the country would be afraid of. Right here for Peyton Thorne, do not make two wrongs a right. Get the ball out of your hands. Survive to play another play. Thorne at the goal line. There's the check down, and it's incomplete. Intended for Hunter. So now it's on Oscar Chapman to punt it from the end zone. Texas A&M could get great field position here. The more and more this game goes on, the more you feel like special teams is going to continue to determine the outcome. Right there, I'd love to see Peyton Thorne hit his receiver right between the chest on that throw. But I'm just thankful that he did not push the ball down the field if I'm his coach and try to force something. You never want to try to make things better, even if you're in a bad situation. Right there, third and 19. An incompletion in the punt is still a win. End over end kick. And a fair catch called for at the 46-yard line of Auburn by Anaya Smith and made. Kick off your week three NFL Sunday, 10 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. The countdown crew on ESPN in the app. And then we've got two Monday night football matchups. Again, the Eagles and Bucks at a special start time of 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific on ABC and ESPN. And the Rams take on the Bengals at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ESPN, ESPN2, and the ESPN Deportes. Two point four percent chance at the start of the season 
the Bucks would be 2-0, mm -hmm. and the Bengals would be 0-2. And it is Max Johnson at quarterback. Le'Veon Moss starts the possession with a one-yard carry. So you know, the Bob. quarterback switch we expected we would have to see has now taken place. Looks like Connor Wigman is out of the game for the rest of the day. Yeah, and if you're Max Johnson, the main thing you want to come in and do is operate the offense. You don't want to turn the football over. You're never going to go out there and play scared, but he has to make sure that he continues the flow that this offense was on earlier in the season because today they've been sputtering a little bit. Maybe he can provide them with the spark. The LSU transfer drops back. And there's a strike to Anaya Smith. That's the first time in four offensive possessions, even with Whitman at quarterback, that it hasn't been a three and out for Texas A&M. Yeah, and if you're Max Johnson, I, I think just Bobby Petrino, that call right there to get him going, a nice little stop route to Anaya Smith, one of your best receivers on the team. Get him in rhythm, let him see the ball completed. That is so crucial for Max Johnson starting out in this game. Ball start. Auburn saw it, and the officials called it. False start. Offense, number eight. Five-yard penalty. Remains first down. Well, the bloodlines are certainly on Max Johnson's side. His father, Brad, of course, won a Super Bowl with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. His uncle's Mark Rick, who, of course, taught a coach to Georgia and Miami. And everyone says his mom, Nikki, might be the best athlete in the family, she was a volleyball player at USF. So what you're saying is he's got good genes. That's what you're saying. <laughs> there he is to throw. Again, he finds an underneath receiver, Jake Johnson, a tight end. Inside the 30, down to the 28, picks up 10 and makes it third and manageable. You know, Bob, going off of that bloodline that he has with his dad, his dad knows a thing or two about how to win games and win a Super Bowl when you have a super dominant defense. Right now, Max Johnson needs to take that same approach into this game. Coming in in the second half, your defense is playing lights out. Don't make the mistakes that can put your defense in a bad spot. Continue to operate the offense like you have on this drive. And pardon me, only second down and five. Beyond Moss, spinning. And forward progress stopped after a yard. So now it is third down and manageable. As Larry Nixon made the stop, third down and four. Third down and four, the number one guy you need to look for is number one, Evan Stewart. I told you earlier that he's unguardable. He does a nice job of separating and giving the quarterback space to throw the ball. So for the lefty, Max Johnson, look for him to be looking for that guy right here at the bottom of your screen. Rushes only three. Johnson out of the pocket. He's going to tuck it under and try to run for it. And it looks like he got on the dot. He picked up five on third down and four. Asante ran him out, but not before. Max Johnson able to move the chains. You can't tell me that this game doesn't mean something to these quarterbacks because they're putting their bodies on the line. Max Johnson right here, willing to go airborne, not sliding, trying to get that first down to keep this Aggie offense on the field. nostalgia from that one right there. Max Johnson with the great ballsmanship on the face, and then he gets it to his brother from the same mother for the touchdown. I absolutely love that's going to be a moment these two are going to remember for a lifetime. Uh. That looks like a touchdown to me. You know, Bob, we we talk about HBO, and that one right there was the epitome of help a brother out. Literally. Literally. Max to Jake for the AM touchdown. And now it is a two-score lead extended by Bond with the extra point. 13-3, Texas AM on top of Auburn. They take the short field and turn it into seven. 
Brother to brother, takes the hit into the end zone, and the Aggies are rolling. I'm not you, I'm not scared. Watch out for the man in the end. We are back with today's Aplac trivia question. Jimbo Fisher, one of five active FBS coaches to win a national championship. Who are the other four? You'll get it if you think about it, obviously. <laughs> The SEC well represented on this list. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Line drive kick. And this will be a touchback. Well, Max Johnson, who just delivered the first career touchdown of Jake Johnson's career. And as we said, it's in the bloodlines. Their father, Brad, Super Bowl champion with the Bucks. Mom, Nikki, a volleyball player at USF. Uncle Mark Rick, 171 games as a head coach at Georgia and Miami. Eight and six over two seasons at LSU. Then came to Texas A&M last year and was part of a quarterback carousel that involved Haynes King starting the year. Max Johnson then got hurt. Connor Wigman taking over this year, but now with Wigman injured today, it's back to Max Johnson, and he finds his brother Jake for a touchdown. Just a beautiful storyline, Bob, and now it looks like we got a new quarterback in there. Robbie Ashford stepping in for Peyton Thorne. So Robbie Ashford getting a chance to hand one off and get this possession going. It's a gain of only a yard as Jeremiah Cobb goes up the middle. Of course, Robbie Ashford was the starter for a good portion of last season, started the final nine games last year but then replaced by Peyton Thorne as the regular starter. As the backup, though, they always have had packages for plays, of plays for him because he's such a good runner. Yeah, and that's why he has four rushing touchdowns and leads the, their team in that category. He's going to lob one here and absolutely airmail Jair Shorter. So it will be third down and nine. And that's been the, the tell the tape for Robbie Ashford. He went through the spring as the starter, and Hugh Freeze realized, okay, this guy is uber talented. He has a strong arm, he has the mobility, but he needs a little bit more time to develop. So they decided to use him in packages. But right now on offense, with only three points, they need a spark. So they're gonna need Robbie Ashford to go through his progressions, but also not be afraid to go do what he does best at this time, and that's move the football with his legs. Six players up on the line of scrimmage for Texas A&M. And a false start will be called on third down and nine, it appears. Don't start. Offense, number 53. Five-yard penalty. Please start now. The 12th man having an effect. As today, we've got two more big games on ABC and the ESPN app. Coach Prime and number 19, Colorado. Squaring off against Bo Nix in Oregon in Eugene at 3.30 Eastern, and then at 7.30 Eastern, Texas in Waco to take on Baylor. A full day of college football barely underway with 9.08 to go in the third quarter here. Third down at 14. Listen to the 12th man. Only a three-man rush. Ashford out of the pocket. He's got checks to the edge. A flag thrown in the offensive backfield. Chris Russell bumped him out at the 25-yard line. And it's going to be holding as Robbie Afford broke the pocket. And Jimbo Fisher already signaling that he will decline the penalty, obviously. Holding offense number 52. That penalty is declined. Resulting play is fourth down. So the quarterback change doesn't change much. It's still a three and out. No, it does not. And if you're going to make that quarterback change, you want to really put Ashford in the best position possible. I know that if they continue with him at quarterback, Philip Montgomery is certainly going to utilize his legs a little bit more on that next drive. Chapman gets it away. And a fair catch made by Anaya Smith. Pretty good field position for Texas A&M at their own 37-yard line as we answer our Aflac trivia question. Aflac. Jimbo Fisher, one of five active FBS coaches to win a national championship. Who are the other four? Uh, I know it's Kirby Smart, Dabo Sweeney, Mac Brown. Oh, come on. Where were we last week? One. 
Uh, Nick Saban. Yes. There we go. Oh, you know, some, some people think that Nick Saban's, uh, you know, yeah. he's, he's washed now. I don't think he's washed. I think Nick Saban's a great coach. I think they just got to figure out what they're doing at quarterback with Jalen Milrow and kind of adapt that offense to that. Up the middle goes Moss. May have lost the football, but it looks like it got covered up. If it was alive, Texas A&M able to get the quick recovery. As Trey Zoon, the left tackle, jumped on top of the loose ball. And obviously, Mack Brown and Jimbo Fisher right now, different addresses than yes. when they won national championships. But yeah, what's the argument that you can have that Nick Saban's not the greatest coach in college football history? Le'Veon Moss gets a push. And he has a first down. Yeah, that's hard to argue eras. It is. Um, it is. Having said that, though, let's put it this way. If there's the Mount Rushmore, he's on. He's certainly on the Mount Rushmore. And, you know, all these coaches in the SEC, they're taking from his lead. Build the culture, set the standard, then chase the standard. We heard that from every coach that we've, we've had this year in the S inside the SEC. His influence has been so great, but everybody just wants to knock him off. And these A&M Aggies are certainly trying to accomplish that. And let's see if Max Johnson can continue this trend of putting points on the board. Le'Veon Moss again. Close to midfield. Elijah McAllister brought him down after a gain of two and a half. You know, A&M's used a lot of running backs, but you're, you're hearing Le'Veon Moss's name a bunch because Bobby Petrino believes not only is he the most talented one of the group right now, I know Ruben Owens is a huge highly touted running back that came in but they do believe Moss has that ability to take take it to the house and they want to get him more touches Johnson on second down and long scans the field and finds Anaya Smith for a first down good vision from Max Johnson he went through his progressions and eventually found an outlet and you'll see him at the top right he's going to scan from right to left and at the top of his drop he kind of gets stuck a little bit but because of the protection he's able to work right to left on the radio dial get it to Anaya Smith and move the chains so Anaya Smith moves the chains he may have been shaken up We've got a couple of players that are a little gimpy right now. Anaya Smith is one, so we'll step aside. Okay. ESPN <laughs> College Football presented by Zales is brought to you by Allstate and the Allstate AFCA Good Works team. Recognizing the athletes for their charitable work. Visit ESPN.com forward slash Allstate to learn more. Pictures from back in 1911, the first meeting between these two teams, all the way back then in Dallas, on a muddy field, Texas A&M's first touchdown, at the time back then, was on a rare forward pass. And the Aggies would beat Hall of Famer Mike Donahue's Tigers 16 to nothing. A&M and Auburn would not meet again for 75 years until the 86 Cotton Bowl. Wow. Hey, Bob, how was it to watch that game? Ah, uh, yeah, see, I, I made a bald spot <laughs> joke about myself earlier. I know. I'm working with children, you and Chris. Back to the offense, Texas A&M. Play action for Max Johnson. He's going to go downtown, hoping for Evan Stewart. Double coverage. He's got it. That's an A&M touchdown. Right down the chimney. Watch him stand tall in the pocket. Find the Wi-Fi connection and airdrop a beauty into Evan Stewart's hands. That throw was mm, 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 finger licking good. That's the offense that we've been looking for all day, Bob. Max Johnson, 5 of 5, 95 yards and a couple of touchdowns. As Connor Wigman, injured ankle at the end of the first half forces Johnson into the game and that's been the difference making player change I told you at the beginning of the second half he could be the spark for this team but it couldn't go any better for him right now because Connor Wigman was playing at what I think would be a Heisman level if they had not lost to Miami but now with Max Johnson you come in and you're balling like this 
Well, last season, Haynes King was the starter at the beginning of the year, but he struggled. Max Johnson came on, but then broke his thumb in week five. So Haynes King took over again. He suffered a toe injury, and eventually, Wigman got a chance to become the starter and then won the job in summer camp. But who knows if he'll keep it if Max Johnson keeps playing like this. 20 to 3. Look at the look in his eyes as he makes that throw. And that's the way to make a contested catch by Evan Stewart. Oh, yeah. Bob Shoes and Robert Griffin III, Chris Button back in College Station. Two touchdowns for AM in three minutes and 20 seconds. Max Johnson, what an impact he's had. Yeah, we talked about him coming out and just running the offense. Don't put your defense in bad positions. And you know what he's done? He's opened up the game for him, hitting the deep shots down the field and making the practical throws, going five for five. This could not be a better outcome for Max Johnson or for the Aggies so far. What does Hugh Freeze now do at quarterback? But he will let this one go through the back of the end zone. We're about to find out after we check in with Matt. Okay, Bob, I know you wanted an update on Michigan and Rutgers, so here it is. Blake Corum punches it in. It is all maize and blue, 31 to 7. A couple of other scores. I want to pass along the things going on. Clemson and Florida State. Clemson with the ball driving up 24 17. Oklahoma up 17 6 on Cincinnati. Thank you, Matt, for the enthusiastic update that Rutgers is now getting whooped <laughs> by Michigan. <laughs> Robbie Ashford is the quarterback. And he takes the high snap, and he will take off. Looking for a running lane, and gets spun down. Not much there. Jacoby Matthews, the tackle after a gain of three and a half. Yeah, really nice job by Jacoby Matthews. And I told you that, you know, offensive coordinator Philip Montgomery was going to utilize Robbie Ashford's legs a little bit more. The only question that you have to ask is now when you're sitting here down 17, how committed do you stay to the running game with the quarterback that is dynamic at it versus trying to open it up and trust him in the passing game? That will be the question for Auburn. Jarquez Hunter bottled up at the line of scrimmage. So now it will be third down and a long six close to seven. And what you Freeze told us, so look, he is a freak of an athlete, is Robbie Ashford. If he can run, he's just an inconsistent thrower. And that's where Peyton Thorne established himself as the starter. Well, here's where you have to deliver a throw, most likely. Yeah, it is. And right now for Texas A&M and their defensive coordinator, DJ Durkin, they're doing a good job of changing the pitcher on the quarterback. Can Robbie Ashford drop back right here and execute a play? It looks like they're going to try to work this bunch set to give their guys free releases. Five-man rush. Another sack. Ashford with nowhere to go. Eventually, Edger and Cooper got to him and brought him down behind the line. Chris Russell with pressure as well. That is six sacks of Auburn quarterbacks by Texas A&M. Oh, yeah. They have been pressuring the quarterback all day. And it was Edger and Cooper who was over the center to get the offensive line into a 5-0 call. And then they know when Robbie Ashford tries to break, you have to beat him to the point of attack. So Edger and Cooper made no mistakes about it. As soon as he saw him try to scramble, he filled the gap as the quarterback spy and made the play. A ton of time left in this game, but now no margin for error for Auburn. Good punt by Chapman. Making the first man miss, Sanaya Smith breaks another tackle and eventually pulled down at the 25-yard line. As we have time now for our weekend lineup brought to you by Wendy's Beef. On Colorado, Oregon, that is certainly a game that will draw a lot of attention coming up on ABC at 3.30 Eastern. Prime time for Texas and Baylor later on tonight. And we're all keeping our eyes, and you have been since opening weekend, on Michael Penix and his Heisman resume as later on tonight, Pac-12 after dark, as Washington will take on Cal. Yeah, Michael Penix Jr. is certainly number one in my Heisman rankings that I put out on Twitter every week. He just climbed there today, and I'm telling you that Coach Prime is at a point now, kind of like Floyd Mayweather. People are watching because they want to see him win. Other people are watching because they want to see him lose. Le'Veon Moss for five yards on first down.
At the beginning of this game, Bob, it felt like Ruben Owens was getting the majority of the, of the touches. But as it's gone on, Le'Veon Moss and his ability has been shining through, and, and he is now, uh, you know, averaging a, a good clip per rush right now. Their offensive line is allowing him to establish himself in this game. Blitz. Johnson out of the pocket. Incomplete. At the feet of Moose Muhammad. So now it's third down and five. You know, the one thing that all AM fans know is that Moose Muhammad, the third, can catch just about everything. So it lets you know how, how bad of a throw that was right there on the run. He's having to reach down and try to catch that ball at his ankles. The number one thing the coaches talked to us this week was this guy catches everything that's thrown at him. So try to get that up a little bit and he'll make that play for you. It's in his bloodlines as well as his father, Mushi Muhammad, was a two-time pro bowler. Mm. Played in the NFL with the Bears and Carolina as well. Anaya Smith stays on his feet. Broken tackle. And Anaya Smith dangerous in the open field. Pulled down from behind at the 42-yard line by Asante. 28 yards. Nice move here by Anaya Smith. He sits down the choice route, and then who does he make miss? It's Donovan Kaufman. The guy's out there trying to cut it back and go score a touchdown. The one thing the Auburn defensive coordinator, Ron Roberts, told us was, uh, we don't really want Donovan in, in coverage all that much. And right there, he just got put in one-on-one -on -one coverage with one of the best receivers in all the SEC. Play action for Johnson. Well protected. Another strike. And it's a first down if it stands. It looks like a flag thrown in the offensive backfield, though. The true freshman, Micah Tease, with the reception. Holding offense number 64. 10 yard penalty. Makes first down. So that'll back Texas A&M up on the Leighton Robinson holding penalty. Yeah, you're going to see Leighton Robinson, number 64, right here. It's going to come off the ball. Pull. Oh, little pull down by the neck and lay on him. Trying to pancake the man. I didn't think that was egregious, but the ref threw the flag. Leighton Robinson trying to lay the smack it down on the guy on the field. <laughs> First and 20. Blitz. Johnson throws right behind the blitz to a wide open Evan Stewart. Cuts it back. Another flag down. Stewart into the red zone if this one stands. Once again, a flag back at the line of scrimmage. It's a beautifully run pick play right there by Tex A&M, but let's see if the ref caught him on it. Pass interference. Offense number 42. Offensive guys like to call it a rub. Defensive guys like to call it a pick. Yeah, and I'm when, it, when it appears to be a pick, that's when the flag comes out. I'm an offensive guy, and I call <laughs> it a pick because I literally saw what happened in the middle of the field. Number 42 right here, Max Wright. Former defensive end. Looks like he might have forgot what side of the ball he was on right here. <laughs> but you're going to see him run this crossing pattern, and it is a rub route. You're trying to run into the defender that is guarding the wide receiver, and he just did it a little bit too well. <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, you have to make it look like you're trying to skinny by the guy and stay in his way. But if you just go up there and slobber knock him in the face, the ref is certainly going to throw the flag. He ran over Cam Riley, and now it is first and 35. Not many plays for first and 35, Rob. Max Johnson being chased and going down. Well, that time he was waiting for something to form up downfield, and Cam Riley had time. On the outside rush to get there and get the sack. Yeah, you talk about Cam Riley. He's going to be coming off the top of the screen, off the edge, a little late pressure. Quarterback feels it. But honestly, guys, when you play in that position and you feel that pressure coming, don't be slow to go. If you're slow to go, they will run you down. They have nothing in their way between you and the ball. Go put your foot in the ground, run fast first, and then be able to look and see the field if you can get away from the pressure. Leon Moss for a couple of yards. 
All right, you said you didn't have a play for first and 35. What do you got for third and 38? Yeah, I mean, what's the score of the game? It's 20 to 3. So uh, third and 38, we're talking screens. We're talking hand the ball off on a draw to the running back. And let your defense and go let, play. And let your defense go play. Do not turn this into a negative by dropping back and trying to convert this third and 20 with some deep down the field concept. That would be my advice if I was Bobby Petrino. There's the screen. They try to set Muhammad up in the tunnel. And he has nowhere to go as the tunnel is closed. That'll keep the clock rolling, though. Under a minute to go in the third quarter. And Constantino will punt for Texas A&M. What did we say the play call was going to be, Bob? Look at that. This, sometimes you can't live life on the edge. You got to play it safe. Do the right thing, and right there they made the right call. Punt this ball away, let your defense keep playing at high level. Auburn looks like they're going to leave the Gunners alone and come after it. And they just about got to Constantino. What a great roll for Texas A&M. He barely got it off. It may have been partially blocked and it still spirals down to the 22 yard line with a roll as we check in with Matt Barrett. Guys watch this play in Florida State Clemson. Klubnik doesn't see the pressure by Kalen Deloach. Now 55 thinks he's going to get it. Deloach is like no I'm the athlete. I'll take care of it. Ties the ball game 24 all Florida State Clemson. You knew that was going to be a tough spot for Florida State. Oh, yeah, going to be a tough spot for sure. Man, it's great to see just college football as we get into these, you know, more competitive matchups. There's no more cupcakes out there. Everything means something now every single week for the rest of the season. It's exciting, man. Yeah, the full-on beginning of conference play. Ashford. He's going to take a shot. He's got one-on-one -on -one coverage. Incomplete. Hoping for Javarius Johnson. You know, when we talked to Hugh Freeze and their offensive coordinator, Philip Montgomery, they said they wanted to get Javarius Johnson involved a little bit more on the outside. Right there was one of the points, but looks like he's coming up a little, little injured. That is not what you want to see. It looks like a hamstring for Javarius Johnson. It has been touchdown passes for Max Johnson who to open up the A&M lead. Who out of this game max johnson thrust in there what have you seen from him in the second half well two straight touchdown drives and he had us down there for a third one to help you know really stretch this lead and we had two costly penalty max playing there he's doing a great job right now i appreciate it thank you coach thank you well, max johnson supplying a spark for texas a&m robbie ashford trying to do the same for auburn and he only picks up a couple of yards tyreek chappelle who was step for step in coverage with Javarius Johnson to end the third quarter, comes up and makes a stop to begin the fourth quarter. And how about domination by Texas A&M in the third? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about 146 to two? I mean, we're talking about 46 passing yards and 68 rushing yards. Auburn's deficiencies are showing up more and more as they get and play against FBS competition. Right now, wide receiver, they don't really believe in their guys on the outside, and it's showing today as they only have two receptions. Where is their answer on third down? Do they have one? Maybe it's Ashford on the run. Oh, it's Thorne back in the game. Tipped ball, knocked down, and Peyton Thorne, who jumped back in on third down and eight to try and pick up a first down, has to bat down his own deflected pass. Bryce Anderson got in the passing lane. Yeah, you're going to see it right here. They bring the eye candy with the motion. Peyton Thorne escapes the pressure right here. Honestly, I wish he would have caught it. I think if he catches that, he might be able to run and then maybe get a couple couple yards. But they always teach you as a quarterback when the ball's tipped up in the air to knock it back down. So he, he didn't overcome coaching there. But, but once again, Auburn's off the field in a hurry. Four straight three and outs for Auburn. Their eighth punt in nine possessions. And you mentioned it. Shane Hooks, a couple of receptions for 20 total yards. Those are the only two receptions in the game yeah. made by wide receivers for Auburn. And, and when you start playing against top-level competition, 
And I think everyone would agree that the SEC is top-level competition. You need guys that can win one-on-one -on -one matchups, guys that you trust as a coach. And right now, I don't think that Auburn has that. And their quarterback play has been really up and down. Well, they're going to review the last play to see if the ball traveled backwards, which is going to definitely affect where Auburn punts from. We are back. Replay confirming that this has been ruled a backwards pass. Obviously, if it's not forwards, it's backwards. So Peyton Thorne, his pass deflected by Bryce Anderson. Now whistles blew, but you'll see the live ball, or what was a live ball, roll all the way back to the nine-yard line yep. where Dylan Wade, the left tackle, picked it up. So as a result, that now is the line of scrimmage. Flags down again. A okay. false start on the punt by Auburn. We'll back them up even further. Start kicking team at the distance to the goal remains fourth down. And now Oscar Chapman will be punting from well back in the end zone. That's certainly not the penalty that you want. There's been way too much laundry on the field today. And when you go back to that play with Peyton Thorne, I said I thought he should have caught it. I thought he should have caught it because he could have got the first down, but it turns out that because they ruled it a backwards pass, he should have caught it so they wouldn't be punting from their own end zone right now. And that ruling cost them with the penalty about 20 yards of field position. Anaya Smith already across midfield. Still on his feet and finally driven back at the 45-yard line of Auburn. 50-yard punt and a 10-yard return by Anaya Smith. Let's take a look at today's road test brought to you by Goodyear. And AM remaining true road games. Of course, they play Arkansas at a neutral field technically in Dallas. So against Tennessee, Ole Miss, and LSU, at least as things stand right now, that is three true road games against three ranked opponents. Oh, my goodness. It just shows you how difficult the stretch can be for an SEC team. And honestly, it's why A&M felt like they were in a little bit of panic mode after that loss to Miami because you know in this conference, you lose two games, it can end really all of your hopes to get to a national championship and you got to win these ones early. Both these teams are finding out who they are today. Toss to Ruben Owens. And he's got four and a half to five yards. Jason Jones made the stop. And next year, we put Oklahoma and Texas in this league. It's as close as college football can get to being in the NFL, where yeah. you can coach your rear end off, your team can play great, you still might lose three or four games. Correct. But now, honestly, with a with a two losses or three losses, when the playoff does expand, you could find yourself in there as an SEC team yep. because the competition is so high, and the, the committee's certainly gonna value that. Owens again, turns the corner, breaks a tackle, and he's got a first down. Gina Sante with another stop for Auburn. But Max Johnson just in a couple of possessions in the third quarter, already outgaining Auburn's entire offense. Man, look at that number. And like I said, it just goes to show you the, the shortcomings of the Auburn's offense right now, personnel-wise. They have some good backs. They got to figure out who's going to be their quarterback and who's going to be able to deliver inside of SEC play. But you got the backup quarterback coming off the bench putting up more yards in the offense. That's not a good thing. Owens again. Flag down. Lost the football. It pops up in the air. Eugene Asante heads the other way. Being chased by Johnson. Asante. Touchdown if it stands. Flag down back at the line of scrimmage. Wow. Just 
plays down the sideline. He's got a saying that says, let's work. And he just put the Auburn Tigers back in this football game. The freshman corner, Kay and Lee, charred it free. Asante takes it for a house call. And with 12-16 to go, a War Eagle team that felt dead in the water might be back in it. Kalen Lee, Kalen Lee with the big hit. Eugene Asante finishes it off. We got ourselves a game. ESPN College Football is presented by Zales. Only at Zales, the diamond store. It was a thriller the first time these two teams met in College Station. Johnny Manziel and Mike Evans hooked up for four touchdowns. Trey Mason, a five-yard score with a minute 19 to go. Auburn ran for 379 yards in that game back in 2013. And they beat number seven, Texas A&M, 45 to 41. Well, a much lower scoring version today, but Auburn now back in the game, down by 10 with 12-16 to go after the defense strikes for seven. And their defense about to go right back out on the field as this will be a touchback to the 25-yard line. Jimbo Fisher in harm's way a moment ago. Yeah, you talk about the defense <laughs> making plays. Look at uh, uh, Eugene Asante right here. But look who's on the field. It's Jimbo Fisher. He's looking at his man saying, I see you seeing me seeing you seeing you. Oh, my gosh. Jimbo almost got <laughs> sent packing. He didn't even try to get off the field. He knew he was in trouble. Luckily, nobody got hurt on that play. Oh, my goodness, Jimbo. We don't want to see you crawling on the sideline because you get hit by some of these D linemen. Well, Jimbo Fisher has his offense back on the field with a two-score lead. And Moss wrapped up and driven back after a gain of three and a half. Cam Riley, another stop for Auburn. Donovan Kaufman is down and injured again. He had concussion-like symptoms after the win against Cal a couple of weeks ago. Did not play last week. And this would be the second time today that Donovan Kaufman will be leaving the game with some type of injury. Auburn gets Nehemiah Pritchett back today, but they've lost DJ James and Zion Puckett as well on the back end. In this SEC opener for Texas A&M and Auburn, a two-score lead for A&M. Max Johnson back to throw under pressure and throws it away. Donovan Kaufman, by the way, was able, it looked like, to shake off that injury. He's got his helmet back on, on the sideline. Zion Puckett on the sideline as well. And it looks like Kaufman's coming back in the game. DJ James has also been able to return. So it's good to see Auburn start to get some guys back in that secondary rather than lose them for lengths of time as they have. Johnson back to throw, scrambles, tucks it under. Right up the middle of the field, diving for a first down and more. It's a good job right there by Max Johnson, recognizing what the defense was in. And the previous play on second down, he got fooled by a show package that Ron Robert does. But as you see him here, he goes through his read, he sees the opening in the middle of the field, and he goes immediately once his mind tells him that he has an opening. Nice job by him. Don't get confused by the back end of what the defense is doing. Trust your instincts. Quick hitter to the outside, miscommunication. Anaya Smith not on the same page as Max Johnson. So it will be second down and 10. You know, one of the differences that Bobby Petrino told us between his offense and Jimbo Fisher's is that the receivers have a little bit more flexibility in their routes. So when you talk about a miscommunication, you see a quarterback throw the out route, what looks like a timing three-step out of the gun versus the receiver running a go. It could be the way that they saw the coverage right there, and he needed to break that one off. Johnson to throw. And it looks like he'll take off again and slide for a couple of yards. And there was obviously a lot of light shown on Jimbo Fisher bringing Bobby Petrino in as his offensive coordinator. Why do you think the two have meshed as well as they have? Because it seems like they are very much at least 
from a play calling standpoint on the same page. Yeah, and Bobby Petrino told us it's because he used to study Florida State when he was at Arkansas and at Louisville and having to play that he wanted to make sure uh, that his offense was doing the newest cutting edge stuff and that's what Jimbo Fisher has done. So these two have actually worked really well together and they play well off each other. We'll talk more about that after this play. Big third down here and that's well shy as Anaya Smith watches that one sail out of bounds. He would have been four yards short of the first down had he caught it. So the Auburn defense gets another stop in a 10 point game with 10 and a half minutes to play. Yeah, that's a great result for Auburn. Their defense <laughs> put the points on the board with the return for a touchdown. Now they're giving their offense another opportunity to try to get this within one score. But back to that Petrino and Jimbo Fisher conversation. I think they're both just scratching each other's backs right now. Petrino gets an opportunity to, to get close to the players and build those relationships, which he wasn't able to do as a head coach because you have so many responsibilities. And Jimbo has to recruit more now than ever with the transfer portal and NIL. Fair catch for Coy Moore at the 10-yard line. Two more big games on ABC and the ESPN app. Coach Prime and number 19, Colorado, and Eugene against Bo Nix and number 10, Oregon, at 3.30 Eastern on ABC. Followed in prime time at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific, by number 3, Texas, in Waco to take on Baylor. Should be two really good games. As we take a look at this week's college football rankings brought to you by Prudential. Well, Michigan has opened up their lead on Rutgers and Florida State and Clemson tied going down to the wire. And a lot of top 10 action under the lights tonight. So the worst starting field position for Auburn. And they'll go back to Robbie Ashford and Ashford. As a first down, as we check in with Chris. Bob, you were talking about Jimbo Fisher giving up play call duties. He's one of several college coaches this season to do that. Hugh Freeze, for the most part, has given up play call calling duties, but Gus Malzahn at UCF, Eli Drinkowitz at Missouri. Just because in today's day and age, Robert alluded to it, NIL, transfer portal, it just becomes too much for a head coach. Nearly breaking free was Jarquez Hunter. And we talked to Jimbo Fisher about that yesterday, correct? That having the play calling duties on your plate as well in the transfer portal NIL world of college football is hard. Oh, yeah. And he said it's because you have to recruit your own players 24-7. It's like every player on your team is a free agent at the same time. So you have to really lock in and make sure that you guys are taken care of. And it's hard to do that and run an offense. That team gets to the outside, breaks a tackle. Brian Batty down the sideline to midfield. The run game for Auburn gets them from their own 10-yard line all the way out just shy of the 50. A 24-yard run by Batty. Yes, nice run by Batty. It's really just a nice, easy counterplay there for the quarterback with the read. And he makes the right read. Robbie Ashford does. And Batty, he's actually been really good today in the running game and also catching the ball out of the backfield, at least for what Auburn has been able to put out there with their yards. Batty has done a nice job. Shamar Turner just came off the field with an apparent injury for Texas A&M. McKinley Jackson just left the field as well. So the sub defensive line out there for the Aggies after the longest offensive play of the day for Auburn. Right back to Betty. Eight more yards. 9.15 to go in the fourth quarter. Damani Richardson with an ankle tackle. Now we talked about when AM was up 20 to 3. How committed could you stay to the running game when you have a quarterback uh, who you trust running the football but are still working through some of the kinks in the passing game? Well, because of that touchdown by Eugene Asante, they can stay committed to the running game here, make it only a two-score game, which is right where they want to be at. Ashford, a little shovel pass. Rivaldo Fairweather fighting for extra yards. His forward progress stopped in the field of play, which keeps the clock moving, but good enough for a first down. Yes, it is. Robbie Ashford's going to come off the fake, try to get outside, and nice job, a little push pass. Not exactly how you want it to be, but that fight you see right there from Rivaldo Fairweather is why they were able to get the first down. And it seems like not that much, guys. But when you got a defense having to run from sideline to sideline when it's 99 degrees out there, it can help wear them down as this game comes to a close. Ashford looks at the bunt set, avoids a sack. Speed to the edge. 
Down to the 35-yard line. Tripped up by Chris Russell, Jr. But picked up five yards. Yeah, you can see the athleticism from Robbie Ashford. You know, I only saw two eligible receivers down the field there. So even though he's trying to create, they're going to have to get a couple more guys out into the pass concept so that he can hit those off-schedule plays. You may, you may remember Javarius Johnson earlier with the tug of the hamstring. He is not out there. And Jay Fair in the slot left has been invisible for the most part today as well. Ice fake by Ashford. Runs a man over. Well, you'd love to see that from your quarterback as he bulldozed Bryce Anderson and picked up six. And looks to be good enough for another first down. Oh, my Lord, Robbie Ashford. You don't see quarterbacks do this very often. Bryce and Anderson, Bryce Anderson thought it was sweet, but it was really sour. He just trumped that man. I think we've seen a guy in Auburn uniform that could do some things like that before. Mr. Uh, Cameron Newton. Here comes the blitz. It's picked up. Ashford takes his shot. Down to the goal line. It's broken up. Josh DeBerry. Beautifully covered. Shane hooks the intended receiver. That's one of those one-on-ones down the field. You're going to see the goal ball. DB's in good position. The receiver goes up, hits him right in the biceps. Sometimes you got to make those plays. And when I mean sometimes, I mean all the time, Bob. As a wideout, when that ball is in the air, it has to be yours. And we have another player down and injured. We'll step aside. 6.45 to go. Aussie on ESPN. Bob Wischusen, Robert Griffin III, Chris Button, the home of the 12th man here at College Station at Kyle Field. And the 12th man making themselves heard as Auburn, with a defensive score, has taken what was once a 20-3 game and made it 20-10. And now Robbie Ashford in the ground attack, looking to make it a one-score game. This time swamped under is Ashford well behind the line. Fadil Diggs got there, and he had company. You want to know how to shut down the zone read? Blitz off the edge and penetrate up front. And that's exactly what the Aggies were able to do. Get to Robbie Asher before he can start getting going and muddy up his reads. What's your play call here in terms of maintaining field goal range if you need to to make this a one score game yeah i'm moving the pocket with robbie anderson I, I i always say this with dual threat guys you want to give them a run pass option but you see right now they're going to spread it out allow the lanes to truly develop themselves and give them a, a lane to run the football down the middle ashford one-handed catch out of the pocket bullets one to the sideline short hops it incomplete flag down Back at the 40-yard line. And Ashford is shaken up. Looks like it might be holding. Holding. Offense, number 62. The supply. The result of play is fourth down. An interesting decision there by Texas A&M. And I'll ask you this. Would you, if you were Jimbo Fisher, have accepted that penalty? which would have maybe backed them out of field goal range, but given them another chance on third down, they decline it. Yeah, it looks like he wants it. And that leaves McPherson in field goal range. Hugh Freeze. And there is the second guess. Yeah, now yeah, they are yeah. going to accept the penalty. Right. And the field goal group will head back to the Auburn sideline. Was, what do you think? It was appearing that Jimbo was saying, I did not. I did not decline that, but you watch it right here. Number 62, Stutz, as the play runs, and he breaks the pocket, that hold right there. That little pullback, as soon as your quarterback breaks the pocket as an offensive lineman, you got to run your feet and push him forward. As soon as the rep sees that pull, he will throw the flag every single time. So Auburn with another crack at it on third down, but it's third and 25. So again, you have to think this is just about trying to get back in field goal range. Yes, and to answer your question, you certainly want to push the kicker out of field goal range. Accept the penalty, make them try to get back in it. Third and 25, not many plays for that, but you got to be careful that you don't give them too much space because one missed tackle in this league, you're hitting your head on the goalpost. And Texas A&M calling a timeout here. So from a defensive coordinator standpoint, now what if you're DJ Durkin or even Jimbo Fisher is the head coach, do you want your defense to understand about 
the goal of this play. Yes. Uh, in third and 25, you, you can be aggressive here. Because, like you said, if they get within field goal range, they get 15 yards here, it's going to make it a one-score game. So if I'm DJ Durkin, I'm making sure I stay aggressive. I'm not saying you bring cover zero blitz, but you let you guys know we're not going to play the sticks. We're going to play this honest, and we're going to make Robbie Ashford make a decision quickly at the quarterback position. And now Peyton Thorne oh, is back that. in the game at quarterback after Ashford shaking up on that last play. In a true throwing situation, you want Peyton Thorne out there. Now you just want him to make the right decision. Jay Fair in motion. A throwback screen to Fairweather. And diagnosed by the AM defense. Malik Silla at defensive end was not fooled. And now with five and a half minutes to go, Auburn has all three timeouts. But the decision to take the penalty by Jimbo Fisher turns out to be a good one. They're out of field goal range. Yes, it does. You play it honest, you play aggressive, you don't play too far back as a defensive play caller. Nice job by DJ Durkin, making his guys understand the situation and attacking the ball on that misdirection screen. End over end kick by Chapman. Anaya Smith lets it bounce, and this will take a hop inside the 15-yard line where it's down by Auburn. As Luke Deal, the tight end, jumps on top of it, Let's check in with Chris. Bob, for 10 years, ESPN has supported the College Football Playoff Foundation, bringing the college football community together during Extra Yards for Teacher Week to celebrate and honor great teachers. Since its inception, the CFP Foundation has recognized over half a million educators. For more, follow at CFP Extra Yard. So today we honor Gloria Fisher, the mother of Jimbo Fisher. She was a chemistry and physics teacher for 51 years. She still serves as a substitute teacher at 86 years old. The Dallas A&M Club endowed an academic scholarship at A&M in her name, and she's braving the heat to support her boy out here today. Now, the best part about that story is she's still a sub. Amari Daniels for two and a half yards. Eugene Asante made the stop. Again, Auburn at some point has three timeouts to spend, but they need two possessions inside of the last four minutes and 45 seconds. So they will certainly be using those timeouts, RG3, at some point. When would you start to use them if you're Hugh Freeze? Oh, man. Honestly, I would use them. I would start using them right after this. If, if you get a, a negative play, you want to use that timeout to preserve as much time as you can. Breaking free is Daniels. And real quickly, look at look at Dion. Coach Prime was Phil Knight prior to the game. The guys, the talk in sports, they're kicking off in just over 20 minutes. Oregon, Colorado, Marquee Day in the Pac-12 over on ABC. Well, Max Johnson inserted into the game for the injured Connor Wigman. He provided a big spark in the third quarter. And now Amari Daniels, that run officially 79 yards down to the four-yard line. And now Auburn needs to rip the ball out. That's about their only chance. 4.04 to go. And they are in danger of being down by three scores once again. As I said, they need to hold on the field goals here in the red zone. But after you give them a big play like that, you got to have a defensive stand. Le'Veon Moss gets a push. That's an AM and touchdown. <laughs> that was 
just bully ball right there. You're going to see here in a second after the extra point how Texas A&M's offensive line moved the line of scrimmage back, allowing Le'Veon Moss to just find his way gently into the end zone. Well, Bobby Petrino told us that if Le'Veon Moss can stay healthy, he's the guy that should carry most of the load in their run game. He's the most talented running back that they have. And his run of 79 yards, or rather, Daniels' run of 79 yards, then Moss's touchdown, all but ends this game. Yeah, it doesn't. We always talk about score with your man or move the line of scrimmage back. And look how many guys are leading that man into the end zone. Three lead blockers. It just looks ugly in there. Bodies laying all over the field. That's a battlefield in the SEC. And right now, the Aggies are winning. That's funny, Bobby Petrino said of Amari Daniels that he's the one guy out of the top three that doesn't necessarily have the breakaway speed. Well, the breakaway speed of Amari Daniels is exactly the turning point here in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I think the Auburn Tigers defenders were shocked that he was back there too. But he did get run down, so he doesn't have the quite finishing speed, but he certainly broke this game open for the Aggies. seconds to go in three timeouts but of course that touchdown puts them in a three score hole and then a booming kick from Bonds through the back of the end zone well the big story that's going to come out of this game especially when we find out what the extent of Connor Wigman's ankle injury is is Max Johnson and will he be the starter going forward for Texas a &M. Yeah, it really just depends on what's going on with Connor Whitman. We came into this game talking about how he could potentially put himself in the Heisman conversation, but it's been all about Max Johnson. He even threw a touchdown to his brother out there in this game. He's been on fire, gave this offense a spark, and at the end of the day, the, all the Aggies want to do is win and play high-level situational football. Right now, they've been doing that all day, and it's been because of that man. Well, Hugh Freeze is going to put his third quarterback in the game as Holden Gariner, the redshirt freshman from Savannah, is going to get a chance to play. One behind Rivaldo Fairweather. So that's an incompletion on first down. That's only the sixth career pass attempt for Holden Gariner. Tough situation for Holden Gariner to be in. You know, you come into this game at the very end, feels like the, you know, the game is over. Coach is taking his quarterbacks out, talking to him on the sideline about this experience. And now he's got to go out there and try to throw the football around. Well, what of Malcolm Johnson? Let's check in with Matt Barry. All right, Bob, we have got controversy going on in Death Valley. Florida State with the ball, fourth and ten going for it. Incomplete. Now there was a pass interference call and Clemson had the ball that they got and appeared the officials have missed two on the Clemson defense. Keep an eye, 24 all, fourth quarter. Wow. <laughs> so right down to the end with controversy as well at Clemson. Garner over the middle. And that will be good enough for a first down. As for the first time today, Jay Fair ends up hauling one in. You know, for Auburn, they told us coming into this game, they didn't really know who they were. That they would find out, you know, the complexities and the strength and the grit that their team has going up against a very talented Texas A&M team. So it's very important that they finish hard right here just for the outcome of the rest of their season. Brian Batty gets to the sideline. Bryce Anderson bumps him out after a gain of eight. And the one thing Auburn's certainly going to have to fix is they're not going to be able to get new players in the middle of the year at wide receiver. Would you agree with that, Bob? But they're going to have to find ways to get these guys involved earlier in the game so that they don't have lulls like this on offense. Shane Hook's nowhere to go. Well, there were times in this game where it looked like they had, as you Freeze put it, 
found something in the run game. Correct. But at this level, if you don't have any kind of a pass game to lean on, at some point your run game is going to either get shut down at the line of scrimmage or have a negative play. Yep. And whenever that happened, their passing game was not there to help. Yeah, it wasn't. But this team has shown you, at least in this game, that they can own the line of scrimmage and they can run the football. So maybe that has to be the shift in focus. We're going to run the football 45, 50 times a game, allow our defense to play really well and keep ourselves in games. When our quarterbacks develop at some point, we can open it up, but right now they're not there. There goes Sean Jackson. And he is a load to bring down at 236 pounds. Eventually, Damani Richardson meets him at the 28-yard line of Texas A&M, but that's a 31-yard scamper for Sean Jackson. Yeah, Sean Jackson out there looking like a fullback, but I'll take a fullback 30-yarder. Mariner lobs one down the right sideline, but that will sail out of bounds. Josh DeBerry step for step with Malcolm Johnson. You know, this feels like what Auburn has to do moving forward. Run the ball, run the ball, and just take shots down the field. But for all their quarterbacks, you have to give your guy a chance. Keep the ball in bounds, allow him to make a play on the football. That's going to be their recipe for success. Explosive pass plays, maybe they get three or four a game, but they're going to have to be a running football team. Blitz, Garner, a one-on-one -on -one lob once again. Out of bounds. Up against the sideline is Hooks. So it will be third down and ten. As I was just saying, when you throw the ball deep down the field, you have to keep it in bounds. Give your receiver a chance. Right here, it's a game of inches, right? You leave that ball one yard further inside, they're probably celebrating a touchdown right now. But because he left it outside, it's not giving his receiver a chance to truly come down with the catch inbounds. Incomplete to the sideline once again. Through the hands of Malcolm Johnson. So it will now be fourth down and ten. And why not go for it if you are Auburn? And the pride of the Texas A&M defense there's 10 points on the board, but their defense has not given up a touchdown. No, 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 it has not. And so, you know, they'd love to end the day keeping Auburn's offense out of the end zone. Yeah, they would. And, and there's been a lot of talk about all these five stars on Texas A&M's defense. And listen, they, if they recruit really well, good for Texas A&M. But these guys have all gotten experience from last year being a young team. Now they're an experienced unit and are looking to make some noise in this SEC West. Garner goes down. And that will do it officially. Edger and Cooper gets the sack on fourth down. And now Texas A&M can take a knee with 1.43 to go. That's the seventh sack of the day for that defensive front. When you show up in SEC play, you better protect your QB. Today, Auburn did not do that, giving up those seven sacks. Edger and Cooper has literally been everywhere on the field. He did have a return for a touchdown call back, but I know all the Auburn fans and all the Auburn uh, players out there saw that return, and the energy today has just been palpable at Cal Field. Amazing output from the defense and the offensive side of the ball. Their quarterback, their backup quarterback, comes in, steps up big, and throws two touchdowns. It's a great outcome for Jimbo Fisher and the Aggies. Will he be their backup quarterback next week? Mm. That'll be the question, and it may be decided for them if Wigman has an ankle injury that's too much to overcome. And they're still running the football. And tacking on some yardage is Le'Veon Moss out to the 45-yard line. Yeah, they're just rubbing it in now, Bob. There's no uh, Donovan Kaufman down for the third time in today's game. Oh, man. So Texas A&M will start off their SEC schedule with a win and a win in their division at that. They take on Arkansas and Dallas coming up next. And then Alabama and Tennessee back-to-back, -back. of course, three true road games in SEC play, all against ranked opponents. Yes, we talked about it before. That is a very, very tough schedule. Doesn't feel like you have any moments to breathe. But that's why this game was so critical. When you're going up against Arkansas and Bama and Tennessee and South Carolina and Ole Miss over your next five games, wow, you cannot afford to lose that very first game in SEC play. And the Aggies 
show themselves to be a, a pretty decent contender here today. Yeah, we talked about the fact that Auburn and Hugh Freeze said we are going to learn a lot about ourselves today. What do you think Texas A&M learned about themselves today? I think they learned that they have one of the top defenses in the SEC. I think they learned that they can get off the field on third downs and on offense that they can trust Max Johnson to push the ball down the field against top-level competition. That's a great recipe for success. And they are still running it, taking a big hit. Here's Moss on the sideline. Next up for Auburn. Yeah. It's a home game against number one. And then back-to-back -back games against ranked teams following that as well. You talked about it. In this league, there is no give up at any point during your schedule. Oh, my God. This is a hard league to play football in. Yeah, look, you got Georgia, LSU, and Ole Miss all back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back. Coming off of a loss against Texas A&M, for Auburn, they learned, I think, what they already knew. They knew that their defense can keep them in most games. They also learned that they don't have the wide receivers to truly compete in this league right now with where they're at. And if they do, they just got to find a way to learn them quickly because they have a lot of transfers in, a lot of moving parts on offense. But this team has to become a dominant running team. Two, three running backs, Robbie Ashford and Peyton Thorne. They're going to have to figure out who their quarterback is. Connor Wigman leaving with an ankle injury at the end of the first half opens the door for Max Johnson in the second half and Max Johnson may have knocked that door down. Yes, he knocked the door down, but make no mistake about it. Connor Wigman is the starter for this Texas A&M Aggies team. They believe in him. I think today what Matt Johnson pulled off showed the coaches that they can trust him if they need him to be the QB for a few weeks or the rest of the season, depending on what Wigman's injury is. 27-10 is your final Texas A&M over Auburn. For Robert Griffin III and Chris Button, I'm Bob Wachuk. Thanks so much for watching. We say so long from College Station, Texas.